documents all the reports and stuff. I remember I even did at the most. I think they take 20 minutes. Yeah. Getting ready to start, folks. Thank you. Make sure you mute your phones, if you would, please. And we're ready to go. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is uh, Friday, March 18th, 2022, and we are live from the City Commissioner's Room at City Hall. This is a regular meeting of the Commissioners of the City of Rehoboth Beach. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order at exactly 2.01 p.m., uh, and with that, will you uh, rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. With that, we'll do roll call. Commissioner uh, Tony Sharp. Here. Commissioner Jay Legree. Here. Commissioner Ed Chernowski. Here. Commissioner uh, Tim Bennett. Here. Commissioner Patrick Gossett. Here. Commissioner Susan Gay. Here. And Mayor Stan Mills is here. We have a full complement of the mayor and commissioners, and uh, so therefore we have a quorum and we are formally able to conduct business today. Thank you all for being here. Uh, and uh, I'd also like to identify some of the staff members that are uh, here with us today. Uh, City Secretary uh, Ann Womack, uh, City Manager Sharon Lynn, City Solicitor Glenn Mendallis, uh, Howard Rothstein of uh, Building and Licensing, uh, Evan Miller, uh, Project Supervisor, and also from the Planning Commission today, we've got uh, Tom West, Luke Met, and uh, our Meta, and uh, Mike Bryan, Chair of the Planning Commission. Welcome. Thank you all for being here uh, today. Uh, I'd also like to thank everybody that's uh, here in person, the citizenry. Thank you for coming. It is such a pleasure. I get so, I'm almost getting giddy. I'm so excited to see faces and smiles and, uh, you know, there could be frowns later, certainly, but uh, it's nice to see your mouth and face and, and your eyes there. Uh, I'd also like to thank all those that are watching. As you know, we live stream these meetings and they're also archived afterwards, so you can Watch it at uh, your leisure anytime and over and over and over again if you so choose. Uh, also like to uh, recognize uh, and thank those that have sent correspondence. Uh, as you can see in, in the agenda, uh, there are embedded five uh, pieces of correspondence that all relate to uh, the 330 Rehoboth Avenue uh, uh, topic. And uh, so they are uh, embedded in the agenda. And uh, with that, we are gonna move to the next item of business, which is approval of minutes. We have four sets of minutes in front of us today, executive sessions held on March 8th and March 15th, 2022, and two special meetings held on February 2nd and March 8th, 2022. Uh, are there any uh, corrections needed to, to any of those sets of minutes? Hearing none, I'd like to... Uh, entertain a motion to adopt the four sets of minutes as presented. So moved. Second. Uh, we have a motion by uh, Commissioner Susan Gay and a second by uh, Commissioner Ed Stranowski to approve the noted four sets of minutes. Uh, is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed? There are no opposed in the minutes. Uh, four sets of minutes as noted are approved uh, as presented to us. Uh, with that, we'll go to the city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. We have uh, two street aid expenditures um, uh, today to vote on, one for Delmarva Power in the amount of $8,410.20 for streetlights, and one for Apple Electric in the amount of $3,152.50 for street light maintenance. That's a total of $562.70. No, it's not. 11,000. 11, 11, 11,000, I'm sorry. 562. <laughs> Mayor, I move approval of street aid expenditures in the total amount of $11,562.70. Second. Uh, we have a motion by uh, Commissioner Stranowski and a second by Commissioner Legree to uh, approve uh, payment of uh, two bills for Demarva Power and Apple Electric in the total amount of $11,562.70. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Uh, those opposed? And the motion's carried uh, to approve that unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, with also, Mayor, um, if I may, uh, the city's current on-call planning consultant, Tom West, who's with us here today, um, Tom West with Greener Planning, uh, notified me um, that he will uh, be completing his service with the city at the end of this month, at the end of March. Um, in, uh, in saying that, I'd like to thank Tom for his hard work and his diligence over the past year. And um, it, uh, it's been very worthwhile and uh, I appreciate your time, Tom. Thank you. Um, Ditto, thank you. Thank you, Tom. The city has signed on with Wallace Montgomery. Um, Wallace Montgomery uh, submitted a proposal to the city. Uh, Lauren Good, obviously the principal has worked is continuing to work on the city CDP and um, will uh, enter, we have entered into an agreement with Wallace Montgomery, with Lauren being the principal there for additional planning services to begin April 1, uh, 2022. Um, there's a list of deliverables that the city will provide and then services uh, to be um, considered by uh, Wallace Montgomery on an as-needed basis. So um, I expect uh, the Lauren and her firm uh, to be available not only to the planning commission, but to city staff, the board of commissioners, uh, as well as other uh, state and county and regional uh, committees there. But um, so uh, that service will begin on, uh, on April 1. Also, um, Weather permitting, uh, Del Dot will be paving the 1A bridge over the canal beginning at 9 a.m. Tuesday, March 22nd. Uh, alternate routes um, into Rehoboth that day will need to be used. Eastbound lanes into Rehoboth will be closed as well as the turn lane for Church Street and westbound traffic will be as normal. Uh, the work is expected to take only one day. The parking meters on Rehoboth Avenue, uh, the new parking meters, I should say, um, will be installed before the season begins, the parking season on May, 5th, May 15th. Uh, work on the concrete foundations for the new parking meters on Rehoboth Avenue began this week, and the work is expected to take approximately two weeks, depending on weather conditions. Uh, staff is working on a plan for the Delaware Avenue restrooms to be opened by Easter weekend, while construction continues on the addition at the uh, Delaware Avenue restrooms. Uh, Pre-final inspection of the phase two contract work at the wastewater treatment plant was conducted and a punch list is being prepared. That work is expected to be completed um, around the end of April. And scheduled maintenance at well eight has been completed. The well is back in service. Scheduled maintenance on well seven is now underway. Once that work is completed, uh, the, sh the city um, should be all set for the increased water use uh, for the summer season. That's what I have, Mayor. Thank right, you. Good. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, any questions by the commissioners of the city manager, um, Mr. Shrenowski? Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, Sharon, who was, or city manager, um, who was involved in making the decision to use Wallace Montgomery for planning services? Was the planning commission involved or just staff? The chair of the planning commission uh, gave a recommendation to Mayor Mills. Mayor Mills and I then reviewed the proposal. Okay. Same process we used uh, to acquire uh, Tom West, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Uh, with that, uh, next item of business is a city solicitor's report. Glenn? Just, just real briefly, Mayor, I just wanted to <clears throat> let everybody know that um, briefing has commenced in the Supreme Court um, appeal in the Ocean Baymart case. Um, the, op the appellate's opening brief was filed on Wednesday, um, so the briefing will continue in that, and I'm still anticipating sometime late this year having a decision in that case. Final decision. That's all, Mayor. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, with that, uh, we'll go to the next item of uh, uh, business, which is uh, departmental reports. Departmental reports, they're embedded in the agenda, so we're not going to go over them uh, today. Uh, the next item of business is uh, board and commission reports. Uh, we have not identified any, but uh, since I have the chair of the planning commission here, I'm going to give him a reminder that uh, uh, we'll, we'll start resuming uh, planning commission reports on a monthly basis, and I'll be approaching board of adjustment and uh, 
Parks and Shade Tree Commission also, because we used to have regular uh, reporting in there, and we would like to resume that. Uh, with that, the next item of business is uh, committee reports. Uh, and you'll find uh, we're going to start off with the Boardwalk and Beach Committee. Uh, and uh, they have a uh, report embedded in the agenda. I've uh, included in the agenda with a little more specificity than normal some of the topics these committees would want to talk about. Uh, again, if, however, if they're going to be substantial discussion, I'm going to ask that we defer them and put them on a future agenda. Uh, so, uh, Commissioner uh, Legree, Boardwalk and uh, Beach Committee, please. Turn me on if you want to. Thanks. Um, we, we talked about a couple of different things, but one particular item needs to have a little bit of illustration. And we received complaints about the way we're upkeeping the Verisano Monument. And we received those complaints from the Italian Heritage Commission here in Delaware, as well as complaints from uh, some of the docents from the uh, uh, museum who led walking tours around the town. So. We took that into consideration, and you'll see uh, on the left is a picture of the Verrazano Monument as it was this summer, and it got bigger than that before the summer was over. But the uh, folks felt like it was just too covered up, it wasn't hard to see. And on the right, you see a photograph of what it was when we first uh, set the monument out. Uh, what, what's happened is that area has been uh, kind of let go to, to be natural. And there's yucca plants growing there. You can see little clumps of grasses growing here and there. And then you see some uh, little scraggly bushes that are growing along the fence there. And some even are over on the left. And the ones on the left, uh, there's cigarette butts down in there and p pieces of paper and wrappers. And uh, I think we need to, to, we think we need to maybe do a little better some way, and I think it's doable. Uh, one of the other th considerations is the summer of 2024 is the 500 year anniversary of Verrazano's voyage up the Atlantic coast, going up, he went as far as the Canadian Maritimes before he headed back to France. And uh, so I'm sure that people from our sister city, Grieve, Italy, which is a little, little town right south of Florence, will probably be coming to look at the monument, as well as other people. This is one of the most viewed monuments in Delaware, primarily because it's on the boardwalk. But we'd like to, ha we'd like to have permission from the Board of Commissioners to see if we could ask maybe Rehoboth and Bloom, or maybe we could have a, a, a committee of our own and, and, and maybe take care of it and put it back the way it was there during the first years when it was uh, uh, installed. And that's what we'd kind of like to do, but, but we need to ask your permission to do that. And that's, uh, that's my few minutes. And you can read uh, a lot more uh, of the background is in, in my report that's in the, um, in the agenda for today. Well, uh, Commissioner, uh, thank you. This is, uh, this is one of these interesting topics where, uh, uh, put that back up, please. Um, you know, uh, the city agrees to, to work with a, an agency and do something, but they don't make any policies. And what the policy not made was who takes care of it and who maintains it and everything. I think the city, when we put that in, assumed that the Verrazano folks would be taking care of it. And they, Verrazano folks, probably assumed that the city would be taking care of it. Uh, I was involved with the, the design of all the dune ends when we rebuilt the, uh, the boardwalk in entirety. And that's every dune end at every street end uh, the, the entire length. Uh, and they were designed as dunes with, with the certain plants put in there and stuff. And I like that rough roughness uh, and also uh, uh, the way they, they were designed. Uh, my rec recollection of the, uh, the beginning design here is exactly as shown there. Uh, all the dune plants were still there, uh, but uh, there was a circumference of, uh, say, 10, 10 feet around the uh, monument. <laughs> Uh, that was gussied up with uh, different uh, flowering plants and everything. So I'd, I would enjoy seeing it going back to that situation, not the entirety of the street and uh, with, with flowers and everything. Uh, and then uh, and then I guess we're the one to be taking care of it from here on out, I suppose. We, so uh, uh, We could. The, uh, the commission folks would do it. The Boardwalk and Beach Committee would, would 
find a committee to do it or, 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 or take, take care of that. Uh, and I suspect if we would ask the Rehoboth and Bloom people, they would probably also agree for it. I don't think we, we'd probably just mulch around the base there, not too far out, because it looks good. The, the, right, the way it looked then, it looked great in those first years. It's just gotten, just gotten uh, a little bit scraggly now. And uh, in the summertime, you can't see it. The beach grasses grow up. But uh, uh, I'd also like to mention that, uh, go back to that, uh, go back once more, <laughs> Don. There you go. Okay. Uh, at the front, the very front corner of that monument, right. uh, yes. uh, up in there where the, your cursor is there, yes. there used to be an actual piece of the Verrazano castle. And uh, it, it, it was just a little piece. Yes. Uh, and uh, I've been looking for it for years, and I don't know if anybody has ever found that. Do you have any idea? According to Nick Caggiano, it's under the monument. He thinks it is under the monument. He thinks it's under the monument. Well, uh, for perhaps during this renovation, we can look for that uh, and have a more substantial uh, mounting system yeah. or something there, because it, had, it, it was about so big, and it actually had some engraving on it or a bronze plaque or something uh, touting where it came from. Uh, my fear is that uh, somebody smart steals it and that it's gone. So, uh, Sharon, did you have anything? Yes, Mayor. I, um, Commissioner Legree, I believe uh, um, the city arborist, Liz Lingo, has been in contact with you. Yes, uh, she did. She said yeah. uh, she likes it natural. And, uh, and when I explained that next year was the 500-year anniversary, she said, well, if you want to put a flower out there or something, we can do that. Yeah, she, she did say that the, um, she, her opinion was that there are a few natives that would actually survive in the harsh, con harsh conditions there on the dunes. And uh, the street end is, is mostly native beach grass and goldenrod and yucca, so that's a non-native plant. Um, but uh, Liz cuts them back on a, on a frequent basis. I know the uh, photo that you showed uh, earlier um, uh, was in the middle of what is the busy season for her uh, and, and her uh, staff. She certainly will keep an eye on that and said that um, the, uh, she'll make an effort, a, a special okay. effort during the, Thank you. the anniversary to make that look beautiful. Thank you. This is also the busiest season on the boardwalk and just a lot of things going on. Okay. Am I good? Uh, now you can take it down if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to hold it up. We got a lot of stuff to do today. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, that's the end of your report? All right. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. We appreciate it. Uh, with that, we're, uh, uh, we'll go to the members of the public when we get to the end of these three reports, just to make it a little quicker and easier. Uh, the next, we'll go to the Environment Committee. Uh, Commissioner Ed Stranowski is the chair of the uh, Environment Committee. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, the Environment Committee has been talking about a sustainable and climate action plan uh, for quite a while. Uh, recently, DENREC um, has established a climate action plan for the state. Uh, the city of Newark um, has, has done the same. Um, Fenwick Island um, has also done it. Um, Dewey Beach has just established a task force uh, for them to establish a climate action plan as well. So um, the Environment Committee um, would like the city of Rehoboth Beach to do the same um, and uh, generally like some direction on how we, how we go about that. What role um, should the Environment Committee have versus the Board of Commissioners? Um, you know, the, the, we would have to have some, uh, probably a consultant do some of the heavy lifting um, and DENREC in their plan has provided funding for municipalities um, to do that. Um, and, um, you know, it's going to take some town hall meetings and, and input from the public. Um, so just a little bit of direction on, on how we, the mayor and commissioners, would, would like them to proceed. Thank you. Uh, well, let's do that then. Uh, rather than put it uh, immediately on a future agenda, let's... Uh solicit from the uh, from the public, but also from the commissioners what things they would like to do. Uh, I, I don't know if we've checked in with Center for the Inland Bays. I think they might have uh, 
uh, any input on this. The Association of Coastal Towns may have uh, something on that. You know, the Center for the Inland Bays has uh, their own comprehensive plan that, that we might want to check into. So uh, let's let's do that and, and do some uh, further organization before we put it on, and sure. I'll be glad to entertain it. Anybody else? Commissioner Legree. As I recall, that was also a significant part of our comprehensive development plan. We could kind of mesh that in all together. Yeah, there's there's a good amount of overlap on the two. Sounds good. Thank you. Anybody else? Anything? Uh, uh, you want to go on to Street and Transportation Committee? Uh, sure, uh, Commissioner Chernowski is also chair of the uh, Street and Transportation Committee. Go ahead. Uh, there, we've got two recommendations from the Street and Streets and Transportation Committee um, listed on the agenda. One is uh, to consider year-round prohibition of left turns on Rehoboth Avenue. Um, the committee feels as though uh, with the increasing numbers of people year round, it's just might be time for us to consider that. Um, and the fact that just the way that um, our streets are laid out, essentially only one car can ever make a left turn and then it's stuck there and sometimes blocking traffic, you know, until the next light turns, turns green. Uh, so that is one recommendation um, from the Streets and Transportation Committee. And uh, the second is we've been talking about uh, examining the need for a crosswalk between 4th and 5th Street on Rehoboth Avenue. Um, there's a pretty long stretch where there is no sidewalk um, and people often are, are jaywalking across the street to get the Dogfish Head or, or um, Chesapeake, Maine. Um, that's about the, the area where a lot of people are jaywalking. So um, Den, uh, Del Dot is... I understand from our public works director is in the preliminary stage of planning a resurfacing of Rehoboth Avenue. Um, so what the Streets and Transportation Committee would like the city to ask DelDOT to look at the feasibility of putting in a sidewalk there um, and have their experts look at, um, at whether it's, it's worth doing or not, um, what the cost would be, what the, the impact on parking spots would be, et cetera. So right. that's another ask from the Streets and Transportation Committee. All right, sounds, it sounds like uh, we can act on both of them as far as the uh, uh, Del Dot and the crosswalks. Uh, that's certainly something we can put on our agenda to talk with them, because we're gonna wanna find out what, what are their plans anyhow for the redo of Rehoboth Avenue. Uh, and then in terms of the, uh, the no left turn, that's kind of a biggie. So uh, I think that we would want to put that on a future agenda sure. so that we let uh, all the public be able to uh, give us some feedback on that. Uh, and Mayor, if I could just give one, one last update. Um, it's not on the agenda, so I don't intend for it to prompt discussion. Uh, just an FYI, the, yesterday we had a Streets and Transportation Committee meeting where we reviewed uh, the past uh, bicycle safety brochures that the city has had, the one that the Homeowners Association has done last year. And with that, um, the Homeowners Association designed it. They printed 10,000 copies. They have since asked that the city take over that, um, the ownership of that brochure. Um, uh, Chief Banks uh, agreed that the brochure is very helpful. His officers use it as education, as well as it was given to a lot of the bicycle shops. Um, so the Streets and Tra Transportation Committee um, agreed yesterday that the city should, in fact, take ownership of that document and handle the printing and delivery of those. So um, I will leave that uh, at the discretion of the city manager um, how to move that forward, but just an FYI for, for all of you. Thank you very much. Any commission uh, questions for any of the chairs? If not, I'd like to go to the members of the public. This is your opportunity. If you'd like to uh, make any comments on the uh, Boardwalk and Beach Committee, Environment Committee and Street and Transportation Committee uh, reports, understanding that uh, substantial conversation would be likely deferred to a future meeting when we actually put it on the agenda and notice it. Anybody? Yes, sir. Uh, Can you, you need to come up? Don't know, Walter. Yeah. Certainly hope so, yes. Thank you. 
Uh, if no members of the public want to say anything, we'll go to the next item of business, which is uh, liaison reports uh, for the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Commissioner Susan Gay is the liaison. Yeah, and Carol is with us today. Do you have an update, Carol? Yeah. yeah. You can come up. Just <laughs> pull that microphone Down a little bit. in front of you there. Thank, thank okay. you, Carol. Okay. Uh, Carol Everhart, Rehoboth Beach, Dewey Beach Chamber of Commerce. I'll give my normal report uh, comparing the occupancy year to date. So if we look at January 1 uh, through mid-March uh, in 2021, on a Saturday night, the occupancy was 17,120. This year, it's 21,605. So it has jumped again. Wednesday night, same story. Uh, 2021, it was 12,436. This year is 15,441. So all indicators are that it's going to be a very strong summer, and I am still being told that uh, pre-bookings are up compared to years ahead uh, in the past. Um, quick legislative, uh, probably everyone's aware that the <clears throat> marijuana, <clears throat> excuse me, recreational marijuana bill that uh, we did oppose uh, that did not pass. Um, SB1 is still in play. There have been a number of concessions uh, at the business community's uh, request and some compromises, so that's moving forward. Um, employment. There was a coordinated and combined effort. The chamber signed on to correspondence through interchange, which does the J1s. The letters were to Senators Coons and Senators Carper. And basically, it requests uh, a program they call the Bridge USA program, which allows the students um, to come into the country based on their, our US embassies in their country. Um, we are in desperate need of employees, everyone knows, and uh, we're hoping that that will um, promote J-1 visas into the area. I can tell you that the decision has not yet been formally made about the International Student Outreach Program that the Chamber works with, um, because we don't know how many we're getting, basically. We're not sure if we can run the program. So they're hoping to make the decision the first week of April. So we've got a few more weeks on that. Um, there was also a very interesting uh, bill that's uh, out there, a piece of correspondence to Senator Coons and Carper, and that has to do with uh, digital platforms. So if, uh, if the city was on a digital platform, Google or Amazon, and you felt as though uh, other competitive, in your case, cities, municipalities, were giving preference or their preference, this bill would uh, eliminate that type of thing. It would secure it and have a protocol for how that's put on the platform. Businesses see it as a competitive negative. Um, and then the only other thing I have is uh, Current chamber activity, you know, we did a lot of alerts on the dining, um, and we did a lot of alerts on the J-1 also. Uh, the DART, Del Dot, has asked us to possibly sell uh, bus passes in the visitor center. We're in conversation with that. If that happens, we'll certainly let everyone know. Merchant's Attic is at the high school. It is March 26. There were 100 spaces. We are 90% sold out on that. Job fair, April 30th, Fairfield on Route 1, if it's successful, meaning we've sold all the spaces for the businesses. But if our applicants don't come, we won't hold another one. We've reserved a uh, time frame uh, in April in case we do get applicants. And um, movies and bonfires in uh, Dewey Beach are all set for the season. So if there's no questions, that's my report. Thank you very much, uh, Carol. We appreciate it. One Any question? question? I, uh, yeah, Carol, if you uh, if you don't mind, um, and thank you. The the chamber had a fantastic mixer last night for St. Patty's Day, and it was great. There were a lot of downtown business owners um, um, there, so thank you. Um, it, related to the J one students, um, what what kind of conversations are you having about housing? And and that's probably one of the biggest challenges. For years, we have been told by several sponsor organizations not just inner exchange, that um, if there's no housing, there'll be no students. So that is an ongoing problem. Um, and it's gotten um, more severe 
because if you, even if you were a business and you had purchased housing just for J1s to rent in the summertime, um, the value of housing now in the area is increased to a point where they may have sold that house or may have sold, you know, decided not to rent it to anyone. Uh, and, and so it's even more critical. Um, I don't know what we need to do. We are working uh, with a company that has uh, been successful in creating, I'm gonna call it workforce housing uh, in, the, in other areas, uh, but the price of land in our area is very expensive, so I think it's something that will have to be done with the state to acquire land. That's my best guess. Uh, thank you for that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Carol. With that, uh, our next uh, liaison report come from the Historical Society. Commissioner Jay Legree is the liaison. The uh, Stormer 62 display is on at the museum. It's upstairs. Go up and take a look. It's, it's really neat to look at all those pictures. I mean, you just can't believe, and to see what the town looked like in 1962. And they have a movie that they, that they showed, uh, but it was, it was so popular, they're gonna, they're gonna keep showing it. It's gonna be shown again on the 26th of March at 1.30 in the afternoon. It's gonna be shown again on the 23rd of April at 1.30. And it's a great movie. And uh, give them a call, sign up, and I suspect that the museum curator will put, would show it as many times as, as you want it, you know, if we just keep getting people to go see it. So it's there at the museum and uh, ready for us to take a look at. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll go to uh, Main Street. Uh, liaison is uh, Commissioner Chernowski. Uh Yep, we're glad to have uh, Greer Manival and, and Dan Slagle here. Hello, my name is Dan Slavo, Executive Director of Rehoboth Beach Main Street. Um, good afternoon, Commissioners, Mayor, City Manager. Um, I'm here with Greer Mandeville. Um, we have a busy spring ahead for Rehoboth Beach Main Street. Um, our BMS just held an Italian meatball showdown. It was an event on Wednesday, March 9th, and Thursday, March 10th. We had five restaurants participate, and over 300 ballots were received. Our goal was to drive business downtown and fill the seats, and it was a success. Um, the winner was the Fibos, was the number one. And But in my mind, everyone was a winner. So for it was an awesome night. Um, we also, um, a fundraiser for Rehoboth and Bloom is the Oldies Dance on Friday, April 29th from 7 to 10. Uh, the location is the Rehoboth Beach Convention Center. Uh, tickets are now on sale at the Rehoboth Beach Main Street office and also on our website. Uh, number three, we have a gumbo crawl event coming up. I'm very excited about it. It's coming back. That is, we're partnering up with Hugh, the owner of the Purple Parrot, and um, it's gonna be a taste of a variety of delicious creations from the owners of participating restaurants. We have 16 restaurants participating in this event. So we're really excited about the participation. It is gonna be on Saturday, April 30th from one to four because we wanna make sure you know everyone goes out for dinner. Um, so we're very excited about that. Tickets will be on sale starting April 1st. And um, we're really excited. Some of the hotels are actually creating package deals where you can spend the weekend and get tickets and all kinds of different deals. So we're excited about the hotels participating in this event. Also on Saturday, May 7th at 10.30 a.m., we're having a Cottage of Town Awards open house at the Rehoboth Beach Main Street office. We will have refreshments and photos of previous winners of that award. Also, uh, stay tuned for the April edition of our Rehoboth Beach newsletter. Um, it will, please email me if you're not receiving the email, please let me know or check your spam. We're trying to make sure everyone gets our uh, newsletter because it highlights downtown businesses, also upcoming events, and also job opportunities. We're reaching out to the businesses to please let us know if you need help. We want to uh, make sure we get that in our newsletter. Um, and also, please stop by the uh, Main Street office. We have a beautiful diorama of what we hope it looked like in 1910, created by Paul Lovett. Any questions for me? Thank you very much. And I'm going to 
I'm going to pick up with a part two of this and uh, just let you know that the board and, and all of Main Street has been really busy. We are going to, on April 9th, have our annual strategic planning day. And uh, fortunately, we've connected with the library. We're going to be making use of their second floor room. Um, and I think it's going to be a terrific day to start to plan ahead, not only for this year, but we're basically looking at a five-year plan uh, that we'll continue to update every year. Um, we'll be there from 9 to 4 uh, on the 9th. Um, of course, now we've got National Volunteer Week coming up, and we want to make sure that we take the opportunity, and we are going to take the opportunity to recognize and celebrate the impact that volunteers make with our group, which is tremendous. Um, and particularly with so many people moving here, because they don't have to be in, uh, in the city to, to uh, work, um, we brought on a lot more volunteers into the whole group. Uh, it's going to be on the 23rd, which is a Saturday, at Grove Park, we've reserved Grove Park uh, through the city, and we're going to do a beverage and breakfast from 9 a.m. to 11.30 in the morning. So again, please, we would love to have all of you come down and, uh, and join us and have breakfast with us that day and celebrate all the volunteers. Um, basically, I just want to make sure that we make sure that we uh, keep your eyes open because Rehoboth and Bloom is coming back full force, if not stronger this year than ever, um, with uh, uh, everything with additional barriers, with uh, additional plantings and things going on, and uh, new areas that we're still working on. And I, I'm looking forward to that. And I think the city is going to uh, take advantage of all the new things that Rehoboth and Bloom is doing with us. Um, the other thing is I just want you to stay tuned because we're going to have a lot of new things coming up in the fall, new events, new things going on, and uh, look forward to, really look forward to this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Any questions? Anybody? Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. With that, we're going to go to the continuance of the public hearing for 330 Rehoboth Avenue, and I'm going to condense uh, or abbreviate uh, the agenda language. Specifically, we are looking toward considering an ordinance to amend the Rehoboth Beach zoning map uh, by rezoning a portion of the property located at 330 Rehoboth Avenue from R1, single family residence district, to C1, central commercial district. Uh, wanted to identify some of the uh, folks here today that are uh, have an involvement with 330 Rehoboth Avenue. Uh, the, Attorney David Hutt is here representing 330, and Don Lockwood uh, is here representing uh, 330 Rehoboth Avenue. Welcome. Uh, we also have uh, three uh, representing the Planning Commission. We And if you would raise your hand, Tom West. Uh, Tom West is our city planner. Uh, right now he is our city planner, has been our city planner. Uh, Luke Mehta is our uh, the new attorney for uh, the Planning Commission. Mike Bryan is the uh, uh, not quite newish uh, chair of the Planning Commission. We want to thank you all for being here. Uh, with that, I want to uh, start off by identifying the support documents. Uh, again, if you go online and you go to the legislative portal, seek the agenda, you will find all these support documents embedded in the agenda. Uh, I count uh, 11 documents. They are the same documents that were provided uh, in the agenda of February 18th, so there's nothing new there. Uh, what is new is some of the additional correspondence embedded in this agenda. There happens to be uh, five items uh, that were received uh, uh, from February 18th through the cutoff date of February 25th. They are embedded in the agenda. Uh, for your uh, viewing pleasure. This, just uh, as a, uh, a note, uh, four of them uh, tend to say uh, they disfavor rezoning and one favors uh, rezoning. But again, you can uh, uh, look at them and interpret them your own way in the agenda. Uh, with that, I want to start off with a reminder of why we are here, and I'm going to ask Glenn to read the resolution or as much as uh, we need to read to give a clear understanding again of where this came from. Uh, and then, Glenn, I'm going to ask you uh, uh, a couple things. Let's let's do that first. 
Thank you, Mayor. So we had a um, resolution to set a public hearing. That's already happened. The ordinance that's under consideration today is as follows. This is the January 21st, 2022 um, version of the ordinance. As the mayor said, the same version that you, you've seen now the last few meetings. This is an ordinance to amend the Rehoboth Beach zoning map referred to at chapter 270, section 270-7 of the Municipal Code of Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, 2001, and the zoning district boundaries as referred to at chapter 270, section 270-8, of the Municipal Code of Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, 2001, by rezoning a portion of the property located at 330 Rehoboth Avenue, Sussex County, tax parcel 334-14.17-139.00, from R1 Single Family Residence District to C1 Central Commercial District. Be it ordained by the commissioners of the City of Rehoboth Beach in session met in the manner following to wit. Section one. The Rehoboth Beach zoning map referred to in Chapter 270, Section 270-7 of the Municipal Code of Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, 2001, and the zoning district boundaries referred to in Chapter 270, Section 270-8 of the Municipal Code of the City of Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, 2001, is amended. B, and the same is hereby amended further um, by rezoning a portion of the property located at 330 Rehoboth Avenue, Sussex County, tax parcel 334-14.17-139.00, from R1 Single Family Residence District to C1 Central Commercial District, such that the entire parcel shall be designated C1 Central Commercial District. Section two, if any provision of this ordinance shall be deemed or held to be invalid or unenforceable for any reason whatsoever, then such invalidity or unenforceability shall not affect any other provision of this ordinance, which may be given effect upon, be given effect without such invalid or unenforceable provision. And to this end, the provisions of this ordinance are hereby declared to be severable. <clears throat> this next section, commissioners, I'm gonna ask you to, if you get to a point where you um, are looking to adopt this ordinance today, I'm gonna ask you to change it. It currently says, section three, this ordinance shall take effect immediately upon its adoption by majority vote of the commissioners of the city of Rehoboth Beach. Um, the city planner reminded me earlier today that this um, zoning amendment would require a comprehensive plan um, amendment because our future, land, our future land use map shows the property as it is currently today split zoned. So you'd have to request um, from the state to revise the comprehensive plan to show the entirety of this property as the, as the commercial designation. So that section three, instead of saying it takes effect immediately, it would take effect upon approval by the state of a comprehensive plan amendment. Any questions about the ordinance? <clears throat> Just curious of that third point there. Sure. Who is then responsible for updating the zoning map to reflect if this change took place? <clears throat> So the, we would do it through the city. I mean, the, the, the keeper of the map is one that hangs in building and licensing, but Max Hamby at IT is the one who actually has control of changing the, the map designation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Uh, with that, I'd like to just have a brief reminder that uh, this is not just an ordinary uh, uh, code change, nor normal uh, code, code changes or amendments. Uh, we are able to present it and then vote on it uh, without a public hearing because this is a zoning issue. Uh, it does require a public hearing. Uh, and again, the language uh, in the agenda starts off with continuance of public hearing. So Glenn, if you take a minute to explain how we got here, uh, how the public hearing of February 18th ended, uh, that, that for instance, we kept the public record open until the 28th. Uh, and then what are rules for a continued discussion among the commissioners? Right, thanks uh, Mayor. So <clears throat> any zoning amendment um, requires a few things. One first is the adoption by um, the mayor and commissioners of a resolution setting a public hearing. So public hearing is required for any zoning change. So once that resolution is adopted, which did occur um, with this application, and I could go back further and say it's already been through the planning commission, but I'm just talking at this, at this stage of the game. Um, so that resolution gets published in a newspaper of general circulation at least 15 days in advance of the public hearing. That happened. Um, the commissioners conducted a public hearing. You have the dates right, February 18 was the public hearing. And th so that was the opportunity for the public to comment on the proposed um, zoning change. The public was here, did comment. Um, at the conclusion of that public hearing, the mayor and commissioners agreed to keep the public hearing open or for written comments only until that following Friday, I believe it was, or was it the following Monday? Uh, following Friday, February 25th, I believe. Yeah. 25th. So at that point, the, both the oral part of the public hearing was closed, and then the written part of the public hearing also has closed. So at this point, everything that's supposed to be coming in from the public has already 
come in. They've got all the evidence that they're allowed to take in at this point under the laws that have been established. And so really, at this stage, the commissioners are to debate and deliberate um, what they've heard and make a decision based upon um, certain criteria that, that they've been through before, you know, character of the neighborhood and those sorts of criteria. But really, at this point, the discussion is all up here. To the extent you have questions um, that we can't find on the record someplace, if there are very discrete um, record issue, we could probably look to the town pl city planner or, or somebody to see if they can point us to that record evidence. But this isn't the opportunity to get new evidence coming in. Um, so that's kind of the, 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 the framework for, or game rules for today. Um, so to the extent you get through the deliberations, you have options. You know, one option is to vote to adopt the ordinance that would rezone it. And as I said, there's another process at the state level you'd have to go through. One, of course, is to eject, reject the application and not rezone the property. And I suppose a third would be if there's some further um, research, review, something else you think you need to know or hear, you could refer it back to the Planning Commission for another round. It would require then another public hearing and everything we've gone through to get to this point. So but those are really um, the three options as, as I see it. Thank you, Glenn. So I just want to reiterate that the uh, role of the Planning Commission uh, representatives being here and the uh, representatives of 330 Rehoboth uh, Avenue being here are very limited. Correct. Right. Right. Uh, so I think it would be appropriate to uh, start uh, today's discussions by an explanation uh, in addressing two questions that uh, were, were posed at the last meeting. Uh, one of them uh, being uh, what is the tax billing status of uh, this property and the second one being uh, referencing the grandfather status of using grade parking for the commercial project if an underground parking garage is constructed and then the on-grade parking lot is restored. So uh, I don't, Sharon or Glenn, if you want to address uh, the tax billing question, basically I want to reiterate that uh, Commissioner Bennett, help me if I'm... Uh, uh, the, the, the goal was to uh, ascertain what the billing status was, tax billing status was, of the uh, property to see whether they're being taxed fully as commercial or residential. Do you want to restate it? Yeah, okay. that's exactly what I was looking for, to see how the city viewed the property and the parcel. Based whether on it was taxed taxing. as a commercial piece of land or it was taxed as commercial and residential. Right. So great. So some, some jurisdictions and, and municipalities included um, do make a distinction between residential versus commercial. Dover, for example, commercial is um, taxed different than, than residential. In the city, um, we have Section 24 of our charter, and it requires the commissioners to establish one tax rate for properties, regardless of whether they're residential or commercial. So it, um, they're not being taxed either. They're just being taxed under the rate that's, that's set annually. And it's just, and it's just one tax bill are there two That's tax right. bills just one okay yeah so uh so really didn't give us any insight into what the intention of the uh question was so thank you tim yeah i'm uh, go uh, ahead just a, a conference of correction I, I believe that there are three tax bills issued for that property um there wait a minute wait a minute no We have we have multiple tax bills for different lots, but or here take a quick peek. Did you, did you check with city staff? Anybody on city staff? And what was their? Did they have a response? Yeah, and, and and just to clarify, in my research, I found that there are three existing tax bills: one for lot 120, uh, another one for lots 122, 24, 26, 28, and then also lot one. Uh, block 10 on 100 State Road. So there are three actual tax bills issued for that parcel. I see. Just three, <clears throat> three lots make up the entire parcel, I guess. So the individual right. lots are taxed. They have the same Here. rate, but they are different parcels. Right. Yeah. But are they right. designated differently? Well, one's not not from a tax perspective, but the re but the lot on State Road is the residential lot. Correct. Right. But it, it states that on the tax bill. We don't. The tax bill does not uh, delineate between commercial or residential. As the charter calls for, it's just a fixed tax rate for the city for all parcels. So this uh, indicates uh, three, uh, three what, tax, taxation uh, uh, entities, but it's still, it's still applicable that there's 
there's no differentiation between right. commercial and residence. So really, it's mute, moot. Yeah. Right. But it's one parcel with three bills. No, they're no, separate they're parcels, separate parcels because that's how they're billed. Um, three we different billings for um, three different ownerships. Okay. I mean, yeah, as, you, as you review that, um, Solicitor, is that not correct? That's correct. It's all, I mean, it's all the same rate, but there are, when, when the city was laid out, I guess there's three separate individual cutouts in that overall property. Correct. Um, so each of them continue to get a separate bill. It's interesting, though, that I, because a lot of these have been merged within the city, and when you see that, it's just, it's just one bill. This one, for some reason, has maintained several bills, but they're all at the same rate. Thanks. So just for my clarification then, because at our last meeting, I thought we viewed that as one parcel or one piece of land. Was that correct or not? So it's one piece of land. You can have multiple. So the city has blocks and lots. So there's multiple lots within there, three of them. Um, but the, it is one parcel. For purposes of what we're doing today, it's one parcel. Okay. Thank you. But how can one parcel have split zone, zoning? Is that what, that's really what we're talking about, right? That's right, yeah. And, and, and courts have said that you can have split zoning. You know, sometimes it, for good reasons, it makes sense to split a, a parcel and then zone part of it one way and part of it another way. So right. it's not, um, there's nothing illegal about having a split zone parcel. No, no I'm not yeah. questioning that, but I just, just stating the fact that it is, if we consider it one parcel, even though there's three tax bills, we still, there's, for zoning purposes, there are two zones set aside for That's that right. area of land. That's right. Okay. So, uh, solicitor, for clarification, if there are three parcels, um, were these never merged? It, if the three lots had been merged, there would only be one parcel. Is that correct? That's that's right. I mean, it, it gets down into a little bit of terminology. I mean, there there is only one parcel. It's comprised of three lots, though. So, is is kind of the terminology that's that's used in the city um, for many many years. We've allowed where property comes into common ownership, one, two, three lots, all in common ownership. There was no process required to go to the county to merge all those properties formally. Okay. They, so they remain separate properties as far as our records go. Um, but the, the code allows for you to use it as if it's one large parcel and the setbacks are set from that overriding boundary line. Let me ask my question in a, a different way. If they wanted to sell one of the lots within the parcel, would they have to, um, would they have to split, or I forget the terminology, subdivide? subdivide. Partition. Um, Partition. Yes, that's the way we've traditionally looked at it. Once they, <laughs> once they merge here, they've merged by use because the hotel and the parking have been used in, or the, the building and the parking has been used in connection with each other as one common use. Okay. Um, so they've merged. So they would require it would be required to go through a planning commission process to to subdivide them. To me, then it is one part. It is one property. Um, if they would have to um, partition or subdivide to to use it differently or, or sell one of them. Okay. That, and and Glenn, also just to clarify, with the three parcels, it's one entire parcel of of the three that is R one currently, and the other two are commercial, right? right. So there's no That's there's right. not a split within the parcels. It's that one of those three parcels is residential. That's the way I understand it, right? All right. Thank you. Uh, so that uh, ends the uh, tax billing question. Uh, the uh, other question posed at the last meeting. Uh, let me try to set it up. You can help me on there. Uh, part of the parcel that uh, zoned uh, residential uh, includes on-grade uh, parking lot. Uh, and the question came up that uh, if uh, underground parking was added and then the on-grade parking was restored, uh, what does that do to this whole situation? Right. If you so, think you could ex explain it further if you need, and then uh, an explanation would be... Sure. So the, so the residential parking is on the residential portion of the property. And um, there was a question last time. I initially understood the question to be, if the parking was left alone and there was no underground parking, would they have to then um, come into compliance with that part of the property? Would they have grandfathered parking in that residential district, I guess, was kind of the question. And I, there was a legal question in my mind as to whether they would be able to or not. I initially thought they perhaps would be able to 
leave the parking there. We've looked at it, um, and if the commercial side of the, of the property redevelops, the residential side will also have to come into conformity. The proposal here, of course, is to have underground parking, so in, in any event, um, if that part, the res residential part of the property is redeveloped, it, it too needs to come into compliance. So, that, so the answer is that under no circumstances would the residential parking be able to remain as it currently is if the commercial side is redeveloped. And uh, if you recall, part of the question last time was uh, questioning building and licensing and what their interpretation would be. Uh, that uh, the Don Molina, the uh, building inspector, had uh, one interpretation, and then uh, uh, the question was, what does the current building inspector, how does he interpret it? Do we have an answer for that? Yeah, I, I, I did, Mayor, I did speak with, with um, Mr. Janice, and his interpretation is as I've just expressed it. If the, if the commercial side redevelops, the residential side will have to come into compliance as well. All right, any questions for the commissioners? Well, I, I just as, as background, when I asked that question, I, I it, it go, comes from the from the very beginning when it was presented in January 19, and it showed actually the above ground parking being used exactly as it is now, which is why I asked the question about the grandfathering, um, because at that point all of the underground parking was under the commercial side, so it was really divided pretty neatly. And I thought, if only, you know, um, and but what I realized later, and I guess this is what you're saying about it coming into compliance just the building of a ramp to go to that underground garage would be an extension of the nonconformity. So it's, it's so close, and yet I understand that, it, that it's, not, it's not quite there. But the plan has actually changed since then, and now there is underground under both the commercial side and the residential side. So clearly, um, you know, a, a, a variance would be needed, or, or, I guess, to, to extend that nonconformity if we didn't rezone. But, um, the, this came up at the end of the last meeting, and I, I just have to say, I, I found it very hopeful because, um, you know, I support keeping the building and the parking line just as they have for many years, and I know that Mr. Hutt has said that on numerous occasions, that that's the goal. Um, but I also heard Mr. Lockwood say at the, at the February 18th meeting that the main goal was to improve the site, and he said, if it's as simple as leaving the parking lot as is, and continuing to build on the commercial site, me and my partners would be 100% behind that. We'd like to get moving as soon as possible. And, and, you know, that was music to my ears because I believe their goals can be achieved with a variance for a slight expansion of that nonconformity to, to, to reach the conformity as, as we've talked about by adding a ramp and adding the underground parking. The, the rezoning is not necessary to achieve that goal. We'll open it up to uh, additional discussion uh, with the, uh, the the goal in mind is to, uh, if we're comfortable, to uh, be able to consider the question about uh, the rezoning. Anybody? Uh, just <clears throat> if I, I could, um, with regards to this, there were also a, a number of covenants that were um, suggested as part of this early on before um, uh, is, is a I guess an alternative, if you will, to the rezoning in this area. Um, and just uh, help me understand that this, these covenants, who are the covenants between and how are they enforced um, and, and what merit or you know, teeth do they really have? Sure, so, so to be clear, the, the, the covenant that's been proposed, is a, it's a restrictive covenant that would place restrictions on the property, but it's not, um, it's not, an alternative to rezoning. It would go hand in hand with rezoning. So it's a proffer that the owner has made who, that basically says, if this property is rezoned as they're requesting it be, um, they will deed restrict the property such that um, there will be nothing in the residential area, there'll be the underground parking, but nothing's extending above ground level other than perhaps some support structure or something for the underground system. Um, that the certain height limitations are, or certain buffering limitations are put on it, but, but there's a series of restrictions that says, here's what's gonna go on that property for a period of 30 years. Um, and then it provides a list of benefited property, or benefited um, parties. And the benefited parties are each parcel um, that touches this parcel as I understand it. Um, I have to go back and look at them again to be sure that I understand each one. But the city is also a benefited property, meaning that if in the next, if you were to rezone this property, this restrictive covenant would be um, recorded with the recorder of deeds. 
if there was a violation of the restrictive covenant, any of those benefited parties would have the right to bring an action to enforce the covenant, and the city would have the right to bring an action to enforce the covenant. So um, it's sort of a, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of an insurance policy that what's gonna be there is a hotel with parking on the residential side for 30 years. Um, I got asked a question about, well, how do we, you know, how would we know that we're going to, the restrictive covenant is actually gonna get recorded and which comes first. The way I've seen this done in other instances, and it doesn't happen often, but there's, um, you, you, you can use a third party escrow agent. So you'd use typically it's another attorney. Um, that attorney would be given basically an agreement that says, here's a signed recorded easement. You are not authorized to record this covenant until and unless the city commissioners approve the zoning ordinance and, this, and the plus process at the state level approves the comprehensive plan um, amendment. Once those two things happen, then that third party escrow agent would be obligated contractually to then go record the restrictive covenant. The covenant would be in place and the zoning would be effectuated. But all of that would involve attorneys Lawsuits, money. Um, Hopefully not lawsuits, but well, <laughs> it would involve but, it, but an appeal or, or a question of the, the covenants, again, it, it's an individual property owner against the larger commercial venue with realistically deeper pockets, if you will, from one homeowner to others. So I'm just, it, it, that, that is of a concern to me in that regard, as it would be to the city as to expenses incurred and, and that type of thing. So that, that the enforcement of those covenants, whether it be 30 years or what have you, are still it's not cut and dry. It would really be determined by a court of law. Is that correct? Well, right. I mean, hopefully every party that's, you know, that's involved with it does what the covenant requires them to do, and there's not litigation. But yes, if there was a moment in time where the covenant needed to be enforced, it would involve <laughs> legal action, attorney's fees, filing fees, yes. But the covenant does not get filed until after there's an approved site plan, right? That is what is in there. I think that's right, yeah. And so if the property should change hands between, let me back up a step. You said earlier that if we approve it today, it does have to go to the state one more step before actually being uh, the rezoning to go through. But that's right. an administrative task, right? In Pretty other words, much. we vote it today, they'll do it. Yeah. That's what they did. Mm -hmm. um, but if the property should change hands between uh, now and and when, the, when there's an approved site plan, or if there isn't, they change their mind, there isn't an approved site plan, or even if the the members of, of, the, of the organizations that are declarants to that covenant change, then it's been rezoned. All bets are off. It's been rezoned and, and the covenants are not in effect if there is no approved site plan. And they're not in effect until there's an approved site plan, right? I'll have to, I'll have to re review, review that to be certain, but I, th I think you're correct uh, about that. I guess what I would, would offer is that, you know, I think the covenant has been offered in in good faith, and there'd be a way to kind of um, paper it, if you will, to make sure that the, the, the covenant doesn't get, you know, the, the site plan doesn't get approved and the covenant, or the site plan gets approved and the covenant never gets recorded. I mean, we, that's something I think we could work through, but I think you're correct that the covenant currently says not until an approved site plan. Right, and, and that to me is where the risk comes in because uh, we walk out of here today and that's a C1 property with all of the permitted uses that go with the C1 property. And it's just, that, that's one of the reasons why I think that the variance is the safer route because it gives the applicant what they have stated that they would like and it protects the city, it protects the residents uh, from you know future development. And I think the other thing that I was a little troubled by uh, is that in the attached to the covenants, the, the, and it was the third revision of the covenants, there had been a couple previous ones, is a, um, a concept plan. And the plan has actually been extended twice since it was originally presented in 2019. So whereas originally the entire current lot that's residential, that's parking, was going to remain as is, it went a little further in June, and then it went a little further in October. So it's actually not accurate now to say that the entire residential lot that's parking is going to remain that way. 
The problem is that the concept plan attached to the covenants is, is very much a, a concept. It's not, it's not measured. There aren't, there aren't specific. I think there are outline measurements of the exterior of the property, the perimeter of the property. But there are not measurements showing how the building encroaches into R1. And it actually encroaches into R1 such that the uh, above ground parking now has half the number of spaces that currently exist. So that's a little, that to me is a, is a, it is a, a detail that hasn't really been dealt with. Um, and there are some other elements to it, too, in terms of the vertical construction, because it can go to 42 feet by code. And you've got it extending, you know, again, halfway into, into residential. Even though it sounds like they'd be willing to take that back. It sounds like from the statement made at the last meeting that they'd be willing to build on the commercial site if they could get going. And that's why I say, you know, I've seen that, I've seen it happen before with, with our site plans where variances have been received and, and with, with the avenue in that, that worked very well. And I don't know why this one couldn't do the same thing. Uh, Glenn, is it, is it fair to say that, that the use of that property as it is now, and I'm, I'm referring to the, the, the side on State Road, the R1 um, lot, is has been used as a commercial the parking lot that's there attached to a commercial building that's a commercial use of the lot it's a commercial use it serves a commercial purpose and and parking lots are not allowed in the residential district so it's it's commercial so, so this is where i i struggle it's been used as a commercial property for 50 years i are there are, are there no sort of vested rights or, or something, some legal jargon that 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 would apply? Well, they, they have, so they have legal non-conforming status, meaning that they're non-conforming because there's parking that's not allowed in the residential district, but it's legal because they had it there when it was allowed, presumably. So they're allowed to continue it as as is until the property redevelops, and at that time they have to come into conformity with with what the current zoning is. So they do have some form of rights, which is a legal non-conforming status, so long as they don't make changes. <clears throat> and I think we also um, have, if, if memory serves me correctly, other examples of use of split zoning within the city. I think if you look at Walls Apartments, um, they are using residential and commercially zoned um, areas for their operation of a commercial business. And most recently, I think the Belmore Hotel is also um, actually three parcels of land that the Belmore sits on with residential and commercial involved. And they are currently have redeveloped. I think it looks great. They're, I forget the name of it, but one of the houses that they've redeveloped as a residential house, but is part of their um, uh, inventory of, of saleable rooms. Um, so I, I, I don't, I, you know, I'd look at, there are other examples in the city that um, have the same uh, split zoning and are, and are operating as, as commercial. But you know, if you make that change, as any of us, if if you're grandfathered in, uh, but if you if you make a change, you have to come up to current codes, and and I think that's um, knowledgeable in the sense of health, safety, and welfare of of the city of moving forward. Um, you know, as I also look back in some history of the city, uh, with regards to uh, its changes in zonings, um, <clears throat> and um, the thing that hits me strongly in this regards, and and been watching this. Um, from up here at times and from the audience at other times, but I don't know of any other rezoning in the city. Uh, I went back as far as like 1960 with Country Club when that was made changes that has gone um, from residential to commercial. Every other zoning change in the city that has taken place, not that there have been a lot of them, but um, a number of them have all been from commercial to residential. Um, and, and I just think that, you know, sets, sets um, in precedent something of, of looking at, you know, I think of the, um, the original design for Country Club, they wanted a 20-story apartment and a um, uh, restaurant and a shopping center and what have you, and that didn't meet too well with the locals at that time, 60 years ago, and the rezoning was, was um, denied. Um, and I just think about myself right now, what a 20-story apartment building would look like in, in um, Country Club Estates right at this present time with a shopping center and what have you. So the foresight of that city commission 
uh, back at that point in time, um, looking ahead. And you know, th these, these changes, you talk about 30 years, well, that was almost 50, 60 years ago. But to look at that and, and how we shape the city and the character of the city, which many of us um, move here for and enjoy, um, to maintain that. I mean, this is, this is just, in my mind, not a quick decision of one small residential lot becoming commercial, but really looking at that into the future and, and possibly setting a precedent for this. So I just kind of have to look at our history, you know, that old saying or adage of the past is prologue, and you have to know where you've been to know where you're going. So I, I look back at, at what has been done by our previous commissioners and, and the board of commissioners and just the actions that they have taken. You also look at what the, had occurred with regards to height limitations on the boardwalk with regards to um, that, that aspect, um, again, looking forward into the future. So those, those are the considerations that are in my mind in trying to make a decision on this. Anybody else? Can I, just to confirm uh, with yeah. the city solicitor, so is it the opinion that that is viewed as a commercial lot? It, it's a residentially zoned lot. Its use is a commercial use. And has been for many years. As long as I know, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what, what are the ramifications of that? It means that uh, they can continue to use the residential portion for parking if and until they go underground and it changes the grandfathering status, correct? I think, Mayor, even if the commercial side of the property is redeveloped, it's going to require that that parking area become consistent with the zoning of that portion. So the parking would have to either be removed, so there's a residential use on that property, or it'd have to be a rezoning or a variance to, to keep that parking. Okay. That could be done with a variance, correct? Correct. Yeah. I mean, if the board grants it, of course, there's a legal standard well, that has to be right. achieved. To, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I, do, I do think what Commissioner Gossett said is interesting about the, the other split zones because they, they are there. And I, I, th I think the, the situation with the Belmore, which was actually the most recent rezoning request in 2015, is very interesting because they came, they came before the commissioners to try to rezone because there is one residential portion on the lot and there was an old house there, an old you know, single-story house. And uh, unfortunately, the recording is not available, so I couldn't listen to it. All I had to look at was the minutes. But by the end of that meeting, the application was withdrawn. There was no interest at all in rezoning. Well, fast forward a few years, and what they've done is taken that one-story house, and, they, and it's on a residential lot. They didn't tear it down. They renovated it. And now it's, it's being rented through the hotel as the Belmore House. So it's a win-win for the, the neighbors who didn't want to see it rezoned commercial and a win-win for the hotel that have created uh, you know, you know a, a marketable uh, house out of it. So, you know, that, that seemed to work very well. But between the Walls uh, property and the Belmore, I, I understand that split zoning is not considered, you know, good urban planning. If you were starting from scratch, you wouldn't do it that way, right? Um, but it seems like here it's in our DNA, and 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 it's all and it's been there for a long time. And I, I guess the other grandfathering thing, and I and, you know, I won't mention the name of the of the specific property, but I know that there's at least one instance where an area was rezoned residential and there's a commercial property sitting in the middle of it and they are grandfathered currently in, as a use. Uh, but if, the, if they were to renovate, they couldn't. They would have to, th th that would have to come into conformity as residential in that area as well, or they would need a variance because I don't, you know, that area was already rezoned. So th there are a number of examples of how these things have been dealt with in the city that don't involve rezoning. So is there any further comment by the commissioners? If not, then uh, I would entertain a motion. Uh, I would like to resolve this today if possible. I'm sure the applicants would like that also. Uh, I would like the motion in the affirmative, please. Uh, and uh, with the, uh, with the um, amendment that Glenn noted earlier. Glenn, can you just, can you refresh Sure, Remember so that. let me come back. Uh, this ordinance shall attack, uh, take effect upon approval of CDP amendment by the state. Right. So what it would be is, because the mayor asked for an, a motion in the affirmative, it would be a motion to adopt the ordinance, rezoning the property at 330, rezoning a portion of the property at 330 Rohabit Avenue from residential to commercial, with one amendment to the ordinance being that the effective date will be upon 
the state's authorization of a comprehensive plan amendment. And somebody can just say so moved. So moved. Can you expect and, and again, vote, moving it or seconding it doesn't mean you're going to vote consistent with the motion. It's just for purposes to get it up for a vote. All right. So we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, we have a motion by uh, Commissioner Chernowski and a second by Commissioner Gossett. And I'm going to let Glenn remind me what thank the you. motion was. Please. Thank, thank you. So the motion is to adopt the ordinance. So a yes vote is, is affirmative. You would be rezoning, voting to rezone the property. Um, when you vote, please give your reasons for why you're voting. The courts have said that they're not going to scour the record of the hearings to see who voted why and, and what the reasons were. So this is the time where it's your opportunity to say why you're either voting for the motion or not for the motion. Things like consistency with character of the neighborhood, things like consistency with code, all of those sorts of things that you've kind of deliberated up here. Now's the time to kind of assimilate it down into your vote. So again, the, uh, the motion on the floor essentially is to adopt the ordinance uh, with the amendment on, on when this shall take effect. It may or may I interrupt one more yes. time. Um, you can rely upon comments your colleagues make while they're voting as well. Yeah, we're going to give reasons and you can refer to your rationale by your colleague that votes ahead of you. Uh, with that, uh, is there uh, any additional discussion? Uh, I'm I'll give, I'll give my readings uh, after I vote. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to just go left to right here or right to left. Uh, Commissioner, uh, we're going to do a, a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner uh, Tony Sharp. Thank you, Mayor. I vote no for the following reasons. Um, the restrictions of R1 zoning should apply. The um, zoning maps should be able to be counted on. It will give assurance to the neighborhoods for integrity, and it supports our residential character, as is mentioned in the CDP. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Legree. Nay, for the reasons that uh, Commissioner Sharp gave, especially about uh, changing the character of the neighborhood. Thank you. Commissioner Chernowski. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I vote yes um, that the, uh, it should be rezoned as requested. Um, the property has been used for commercial, uh, for commercial purposes for over 50 years. The use of the property has been open and notorious without objection from the city or neighbors. It has been, accept it has been an acceptable use by the city. Uh, under those circumstances, rezoning is equitable. Although there are residentially zoned properties abutting, rezoning this parcel is consistent with the CDP and the use of other properties, such as the property immediately adjacent to the east and the properties uh, across uh, State Road uh, to the west. Um, split zoning um, is a bad practice, um, and I, I vote in favor for those reasons. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gay? Yeah, I vote no. Um, I believe that the historical precedents are being upheld in the upcoming new CDP with multiple statements that would argue in favor of keeping the R1 zone. Um, first of all, the 2020 plan uh, maintains the goals that were stated in the 2010 plan about, um, and there's a statement here, that the city will assure that its land use and zoning code are drawn to avoid any negative impact of commercial development upon residential neighborhoods. In addition to maintaining that goal in the 2020 plan, the, plan, the new plan goes further, and it emphasizes balance and compatibility with existing scale in each and every point made about commercial redevelopment. And there's an entire position statement on general use of land that supports that. In addition, the 2020 CDP includes a future land use map that does not contemplate any rezonings and does not recommend expanding any commercial zone or reducing any residential zone. So for those reasons, I, I think that the change would not be in character uh, with the surrounding area and not consistent with the goals of the CDP, both the 2010 and the new 2020. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gossett? I vote uh, no, uh, as based on the proposed uh, rezoning does not meet the purpose of the zoning ordinance in that it does not promote the orderly growth, convenience, order, <clears throat> and welfare of the city of Rehoboth Beach. 
and it does not bring the zoning map into conformity with the sound zoning ordinances that we profess. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bennett. Thank you. Well, I'm certainly sympathetic to the residents. Uh, I'm going to vote yes as, uh, for the reasons that uh, Commissioner Shinowski gave. Plus, I also believe that this property has been used and has been viewed as a commercial entity for some time. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and the chair is going to vote no. Uh, you know, this is, uh, to me, I look at this as about uh, two zones. Uh, I find that the owner can make reasonable use of both the commercial and the residential uh, zone portions of the property as is. Uh, for me, the rezoning of the residential to commercial is not addressed in the CDP. Uh, as was intimated earlier, other uh, rezonings in the city within the CDP have much more specificity. Uh, it actually uh, indicates that, uh, say, the fifth block or fourth block of uh, Sussex, by example, would be rezoned. We don't have direct reference here. Uh, I believe the rezoning would have a negative impact on the abutting residential properties based on the potential commercial uses allowed above just parking if rezoned, uh, specific, by example, for uh, light air and nose uh, impacts, uh, noise impacts. Um, for me, with the current design proposal uh, to underground the parking on residential portions and restore grade parking seems to be a good proposal that should not be offensive to neighbors. In fact, we at least had at least one neighbor uh, previously saying so, and he says he also speaks for some of his neighbors at uh, one of the uh, residential units closest to this uh, residentially zoned lot. So this seems to me to be more appropriate for consideration by the Board of Adjustment uh, and some form of variance rather than a rezoning. And that's one of the reasons for my thing. I also uh, uh, agree with uh, the explanation from Commissioner Sharp. Uh, with that, the, uh, the vote is uh, what? Uh, five no's, two yeses, uh, and so the motion fails. Uh, I want to thank everybody for your time and commitment uh, to looking this over and to the public that uh, had their say so uh, at the previous public hearing. Thank you very much. With that, we're going to go into our next item of business, uh, and that is uh, the first item of old business, uh, specifically. Consider nomination of Commissioner Jay Legree to chair position for the storm. Uh, to the chair position for the Stormwater Utility Task Force. This should just be a simple uh, nomination motion. Uh, uh, Mayor, I move we uh, we nominate Commissioner Jay Legree to chair the position of the uh, for the Stormwater Utility Task Force. Second. second. We've got a, a motion by uh, Commissioner Shernowski and a second by Commissioner Tony Sharp to nominate uh, Commissioner Jay Legree to fill the chair position for the Stormwater Utility Task Force. Is there any... Uh, discussion? Is there any member of the public who wants to comment? Uh, if not, then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just do a group vote. To all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, and the motion, I'm sorry, and the motion is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Can I just say I appreciate the Commissioner Legree taking this on. It's going to be a lot of work, but I think he's the right one to head this project. I really appreciate your time and and willingness to step forward on it. Thank you. Their first meeting is the 5th of April, and it will be uh, broadcast, so we'll be able to, to see. And uh, most of the tasks have already been laid out by the consultant. Uh, a contract was signed in February of 2019, and it's Thank you. all straightened out. I just have to sit and watch. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad that we can blame you when people start <laughs> getting uh, new fees. Well, Jay. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Congratulations. Uh, with that, we'll go to the second item of old business, which is to consider nomination of Elise Moore to fill the unexpired term of John Dewey on the Street and Transportation Committee. Can I get a nomination, please? Uh, Mayor, I move to uh, nominate Elise Moore to fill the unexpired term of John Dewey on the Streets and Transportation Committee. Second. Uh, we have a motion by Commissioner Sarnowski and a second by Commissioner Tim Bennett to... Uh, uh, nominate Elise Moore to fill the unexpired term of John Dewey on the Street and Transportation Committee. Is there any discussion? Is there any public comment? 
If not, uh, we'll do a group uh, vote. All those in favor of uh, Elise Moore signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed? Uh, there are none opposed. And uh, so we'll congratulate Elise Moore for being uh, uh, approved to uh, fill the unexpired term of John Duty on the uh, Street and Transportation Committee. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, next item of uh, old business is to consider adoption of a resolution proposing that a public hearing be held on the subject of attending, amending the Rehoboth Beach Municipal Code Chapter 270 by amending, amending sections 270-4 and amending section 270-46.1.2 and by amending the small wireless communications facility design manual referenced in the code uh, relating to tower-based communication facilities, a non-tower wireless communication facilities and small wireless communication facilities, and providing further for the regulation of wireless communication facilities. You'll notice it embedded in the agenda are for, for support documents, uh, including the wireless uh, resolution. Jen, uh, Glenn, do you want to uh, uh, read uh, the appropriate parts of the uh, resolution for us as much as you need to uh, give us a clear understanding of what we're going to be entertaining. In Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So this is a zoning change. Um, just like the last item, it requires a public hearing. Um, so there's a resolution set. Should you decide to go forward with the public hearing? I'll read it in, in title, even, although the mayor just basically read the, <laughs> read the title pretty close. Resolution by the commissioners of the city of Rehoboth Beach proposing that a public hearing be held on the subject of amending the Rehoboth Beach Municipal Code Chapter 270 by amending sections 270-4 and 270-46.1.2 and the small wireless communications facility design manual referenced in section 270-46.1.2 C1O relating to tower-based wireless communications facilities, non-tower wireless communications facilities, and small wireless communications facilities and providing further for the regulation of such wireless communications facilities. So this is the document that should you adopt it, you'd set a date and we'd insert that date into the resolution and that would be the date for the public hearing. Thank you, uh, thank you. And with that, I would like to uh, insert the date of 19th of April at two, uh, I'm sorry, uh, nine o'clock a.m. Uh, if you recall, I uh, sent you all a note indicating that April 15th, our normal regular meeting date is uh, coincides with Good Friday. Uh, and uh, I picked uh, the Tuesday, the 19th of April at nine o'clock, not our normal meeting time, but nine o'clock uh, on the 19th. Uh, so again, we have had multiple conversations uh, about what the amendments are. There are amendments to the wireless code itself, and there are significant uh, amendments to the design manual. Uh, we've gone over these multiple times. There seemed to be a consensus at the last meeting to uh, seek resolution. So this is, this is not voting on uh, the design manual or the amendments. This is uh, voting on scheduling a public hearing uh, to hear it and make that decision. Uh, with that, uh, I would entertain a, a motion to uh, adopt the resolution before us. Uh, to seek to uh, have a public hearing on the 19th of April at 9 o'clock a.m. Uh, in the matter noted. Move to approve. Second. Uh, we have a motion by Commissioner uh, Tony Sharp and a second by Commissioner Ed Chernowski to uh, adopt a resolution uh, in the matter of uh, uh, amending the wireless code as well as amending the design manual uh, within the uh, reference in the wireless code and scheduling public hearing for the 19th of April, which is a Tuesday at nine o'clock a.m. Is there any further discussion? Uh, do I go to the public for this? This is, they get their say so. It, it's at your discretion, Mayor. This so, is just setting a public hearing. So, uh, this they're is, gonna, they're, right, they're gonna have an opportunity to comment at their public hearing for right sure. Here. All righty, so uh, uh, with that, uh, I would, uh, we've got a motion and a second to adopt the resolution as noted. Uh, with that, we'll do a, just a group uh, vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, all those opposed. Uh, and the motion uh, to establish a uh, uh, setting a resolution to set the uh, public hearing on this is uh, adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see here.
We'll go on to the next item of old business, which is consider adoption of a resolution establishing policy for restaurants to use public outdoor dining. Uh, if you recall, we've had uh, multiple uh, uh, discussions on uh, outdoor dining, post-pandemic uh, timeframe, if you will, that uh, during the uh, pandemic, uh, the governor was good enough to uh, allow expansion of restaurant uh, floor plans to the outdoors, doors and city of Rehoboth uh, embraced that. But we also suspended a lot of the rules. And now with the pandemic coming to a close, we've said now it's time to reestablish rules uh, for the uh, greater safety and for uh, uh, fairness for everybody. Uh, we have first introduced the outdoor dining on March 1st. Uh, and we had uh, a second uh, meeting on uh, March 7th third meeting on March 15th, and here we are at our fourth meeting voting on it uh, on March 18th. You recall that during those other three meetings, uh, we had uh, multiple slideshows and presentations. Uh, we had explanations and illustrations to try to make it as clear as possible. We presented draft policy, uh, and uh, just a reminder that as part of this policy, uh, it indicates that there will be an evaluation of uh, the whole program uh, at some point in the future. Uh, with that, uh, this is version 7A that's embedded in the agenda. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, Mayor, I might, I, I might interject. We've, yeah. got a, we've got a resolution prepared that did not um, make it, in, it did not get embedded in the agenda. So I'd like to read it. It's a resolution yes, that yes, would yes. adopt the, the policy. So here's the resolution. It's a resolution by the commissioners of the city of Rehoboth Beach establishing a policy for outdoor dining on public space and a licensing procedure for outdoor dining on public space. Whereas during the state of emergency declared by Governor Carney due to COVID-19 pandemic, the allowable number of indoor restaurant patrons was significantly reduced. Whereas in an effort to help alleviate the economic challenges created by the reduction in indoor patrons, the city of Rehoboth Beach permitted restaurant proprietors complying with certain parameters to use public space for outdoor dining. Whereas indoor restaurant capacity has returned to 100% after the restrictions imposed by the governor's state of emergency order were lifted. Whereas given the success of the city's outdoor dining on public space program during the state of emergency order, the mayor and commissioners desire to establish a policy for outdoor dining on public space and an associated licensing procedure. Whereas pedestrians use of public sidewalks is expected to return to pre-COVID density or greater. Whereas safe transit of pedestrians on the sidewalk, including passage around on sidewalk outdoor dining areas is a priority. Whereas in light of the fact that a new policy for outdoor dining on public space will be established, the mayor and commissioners desire to revoke all prior approvals of the use of public space for outdoor dining, such that all use of public space for outdoor dining shall, shall be subject to the policy and licensing procedure established pursuant to this resolution. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the commissioners of the city of Rehoboth Beach in session met this 18th day of March 2022, that the Rehoboth Beach mayor and commissioners establish the policy for outdoor dining on public space and the licensing procedure for outdoor dining on public space attached here to is exhibit A, and the mayor mentions that's version 7A. Be it further resolved as of June 1, 2022, the mayor and city commissioners of the city of Rehoboth Beach hereby revoke any and all prior approvals of the use of public space for outdoor dining, such that all use of public space for outdoor dining shall be subject to the policy for outdoor dining on public space and licensing procedure for outdoor dining on public space established pursuant to this resolution. And the resolution must take effect immediately upon its adoption by the, by the commissioners. Um, that's, did you want to comment on the second paragraph? Uh, no, uh, what I wanted you to do, if you would, uh, please, is uh, since this is this is essentially all been presented for, the, what, the, what is new is uh, the inclusion of a revocation of your existing uh, outdoor dining thing. And if you explain the rationale for and, and the need to have that in here. Sure. So, uh, Mayor, so during the um, state of emergency, the, the order itself provided certain allowances for municipalities to grant these um, approvals. The city you know, pivoted very quickly, um, got a process and a procedure together, um, granted a lot of several um, outdoor dining on public space permits, if you will. After that, um, House Bill 149 came along and that bill basically instructs, not instructs, it basically um, it makes it very flexible for the Office of Alcohol Beverage Control Commissioner to allow that outdoor dining to continue. And we, when we met with the commissioner, she advised that 
um, to the extent we're establishing a new policy and you want folks to be under that, everybody should be under that policy because there's an argument that the existing approvals will continue to remain and she won't be able to, she would, the commissioner would not be able to revoke them if the city didn't revoke them itself. So this establishes a date of June 1 when, they, when they'd be revoked. So hopefully there's enough time between this being adopted today, um, that the proprietors who are currently doing outdoor dining making application to the city, the city approving that application, and then that proprietor doing whatever you know, is necessary at the state level, the alcohol beverage control commissioner level, for her, for her approval. We think, you know, based upon the discussion we had with her, we think that June 1 should provide that amount of time. If for some reason it seems um, that that won't be enough time, you could always revisit this resolution and extend it. You have the authority to do it since you're setting the date. But we wanted to kind of, you know, set, I thought it would make sense to set a time that everybody was marching toward to try and get this all done, certainly, you know, by June. Well, technically, without this, uh, the revocations uh, based on the lack of the, the ending of the state of emergency would be March 31st. So I think this is very generous, uh, giving them additional time. Uh, I want to make sure the commissioners understand this, that uh, anybody that has outside, outside dining right now, uh, if, this, if this passes, uh, their outside dining permission would be revoked. Uh, but if this passes, we're also giving them a path forward to reestablish their outside dining under new rules. Right. Is there any, any? Yeah, clarification. Um, so if, if someone makes an application to the city, then gets the approval from the, the alcohol uh, control commissioner, they would not be able to start outdoor dining until June 1? No. Okay. If, you, if you approve this today, as soon as, as they're allowed to continue what they have until June 1, hopefully, um, before June 1, they'll make application to the city, the city will approve it, and the ABC commissioner will approve it, and they'll be able to continue exactly the way they are, or what, under whatever changes they have to make under these new, new parameters. But if there's a, there's a restaurant that's not doing it right now, if they come to the city you know, tomorrow and make application, and the city approves it within a short period of time, and, this, and the ABC commissioner approves it within a short period of time, they can start as soon as they have those approvals. They don't have to wait till June. Again, I want to make sure we're very clear, and I want to go to the members of the public so that they understand, too. Look, you, you know out, out there we've got some restaurants that have outdoor dining right now. Uh, technically, they should expire March 31st, but we're saying formally we're going to re revoke them and have them expire June 1st. Uh, if this passes, the prudent thing would be for anybody that wants to continue with outdoor dining uh, to apply immediately as quickly as they can because then they would, uh, if they're allowed to do it, they would be able to establish a new outdoor dining site uh, to replace what they have there now with uh, loss of, uh, uh, without loss of any continuity. So again, I want to make sure up here we understand that and I want to go to the uh, members of the public. Plus, Mayor, I think I heard Glenn say that if, as an example, there were to be some backlogs or something here at City Hall for the paperwork or the um, Alcohol Commission, that we could re-look at that date of June 1st if we absolutely needed to push it forward. You would be able to, Commissioner, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Go to public now before we... uh, yeah, I thought uh, I would uh, go to the members of the public first. It uh, looks like some inquisitive faces out there. <laughs> so uh, uh, would you have, uh, again, uh, this is uh, not a zoning issue. So we are able to vote on this today. And uh, the result of that vote would be likely that we would either adopt it or the policy would be uh, rejected. And uh, so this is your opportunity to... Uh, uh, go ahead and comment on this. Uh, Mayor, it may be worth mentioning yep. again that it's this is only public space. Yes. This is not private property. Uh, correct. Uh, yeah, correct. This is, uh, this is uh, the resolution has to do with outdoor dining on public space. It has nothing to do with private space. I'm Kate Wall, owner of Shore Break Lodge Restaurant at 10 Wilmington Avenue. And the reason I'm here today is to um, ask you to either hold off on voting or providing a solution to the restaurants that are on the south side of Wilmington, first and second block, because what you're proposing 
we do not have the dimensions to apply for that outdoor dining. So we're not getting equal opportunity to uh, have that revenue of outdoor dining, and you're only allowing it to the um, businesses that have city sidewalks that adhere to the dimensions, which I believe only applies uh, to Rehoboth Avenue. All right, thank you. So I would you. like you to consider that today. Thank you, Kate. And I'm Yolanda Pineda from Mariachi, and I guess I'm also here for the same reason. Stand a little closer to that microphone so okay. that people at home can hear you too. Thank you, thank you. And do, you know, I do want to say one thing that I do appreciate all the hard work you all did to support us. And I know the whole businesses and everyone is, is grateful, and we do appreciate. And now we're approaching to a different stage, I guess, and our businesses to try to survive. And uh, we want to have the same opportunity that everyone else will have. And if it, you pr propose the voting and think about it, how can we also participate and survive? Uh, like, we try hard to and Rehoboth is a unique town, and I'm really proud and very, you know, to have come here and, and be part of this community. So I'm just asking for all of you to think about it and, and try to keep us in mind, too. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Anybody else? Carol, go ahead. Uh, Carol Everhart, Rehoboth Beach, Dewey Beach Chamber of Commerce. Um, as usual, we're back to one size doesn't fit all. And if there were comments that came back, they were, as you just heard. Um, I don't know how to fix that with the uh, uh, rules and regulations and uh, ADA and liquor board and everything that's involved in that. But those are the only um, concerns that have been expressed uh, to the chamber. I just want to make, I'm sure, on what you're saying about the June 1. So if I am a restaurant outside now, I, ha I can continue until June 1? Correct, if this passes, yes. Okay, I want to continue to serve. I must apply and meet the criteria. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, and if I'm new, I'm a new, I, oh, this year I wanna do this, I must apply and meet the criteria. Correct, correct. Okay. Correct. Am I missing anything? Well, the one, Carol, the only thing I'd say is that make sure your membership knows that, like, don't wait. Yes. Apply because, you know, we're, we want to get things processed and we don't want to have any break in the continuity, as the mayor says. So the sooner they apply, even the ones that are doing it now, they shouldn't assume that they're going to be able to continue beyond June 1 if they don't make an early application. That was my next question. So the, the, the process is apply now. Yes. Is the application going to be available online? Uh, by, and, by Monday, well, yes. On Monday, it'll be available online. Right, so they apply. Yes, ma'am. They pay a part of the fee for application fee. Um, there's review of their site. Correct. And once that's approved, that this is what you can and cannot do, you meet the criteria, then they're approved and they pay the remainder of the fee that's necessary. Is that it? What what they, if I may, what they'd be paying for is the actual license. Uh, cost. For um, a year. There's an application or a uh, application fee that's set out, and then there would be the uh, business or restaurant license that would uh, license them for outdoor dining on public space. And I would ask to make that very clear that this is public space, right. um, not any private dining that is existing as a result of outdoor dining previously. Um, that this overlap, if you will, for um, ex expiring, that we've extended it to June 1. This would only be applying, um, that was, well, would cover people, but again, this is only for dining on public space. I understand. Okay, so application should be up there early next week. Apply right away. Um, and uh, uh, there's an application fee. Um, once it's, uh, it's designed, you know what you're going to do. It's approved. You turn it in. And that's when you pay the remainder, and that's for a one-year license. That's correct. One year. 
Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, Thank you. and maybe I'm wrong, but isn't there another piece to this? Just to be clear, the, the, the state, right? To, or no? It's to answer Carol's question. The, the aspect Are you of... you talking about the alcohol commissioner's part in it? Uh, right. Yes. Well, we've said before that uh, we want you to apply as early as possible, and part of the rationale is it takes time for the city of Rehoboth Beach personnel to process it, go out there, survey it, meet with you most likely, and, and make a ruling. Uh, and then after that's done, they will send a note to, and it's favorable, then building and licensing will send a note to the Office of the Alcohol Beverage uh, Commissioner, uh, and then subsequently the restaurateur would have filed also with the state. And so those two documents, the application directly to the state and the note from the city indicating that there's been a favorable review and an agreement that they can have the outdoor dining, then the state has to act on it. And the thing is, the state alcohol commissioner told us that there's a time frame for it. And it all depends on how much, uh, how many applicants come in front of them. Mm -hmm. They can't say whether they can turn it around in two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, or eight weeks. Uh, so everybody needs needs to know that. But uh, uh, as soon as they get that, then obviously they can set up. So some restaurant tours, uh, if they get they get in early, maybe they can have uh, their their uh, approved dining system on the sidewalks by May 1st, and maybe others don't get it till June 1st. Uh, it, it, it's all uh, a question of timing. It, it is. And let me also mention, Mary, that um, this, is, this is not just for restaurants that serve alcohol. I mean, it's also for restaurants that don't serve alcohol. And they, for them, it's only a one-step process, the city's approval. But if, it's a, if it serves alcohol and wants to serve alcohol in its outdoor space, it's two steps, approval from the city, approval from the state alcoholic beverage control commissioner. Okay, but if I don't have my approval from the uh, alcohol and beverage, uh, I can still run my restaurant outside as long as I've put in my application and received it, or can, do I have to wait until I have both? No, I think you could still do your restaurant outside, but you wouldn't be able to do alcohol service. We, this, okay. The commissioners can't authorize the sale or service of alcohol areas. Only the ABC commissioner can do that, and the city code enforcement officer will be making sure there's no alcohol in that area. If, Okay. okay, with that, Howard? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say that uh, I'm very much in favor of this, obviously, because I'm one of the authors. Uh, we worked with a good group of uh, people, Commissioner Patrick Gossett. I worked with him and uh, uh, building and licensing folks and uh, uh, city manager, except to, to go through this. So we had very different perspectives bringing this together. Uh, I'm very pleased with the process that we use. We started with some foundational philosophies that formed the basis for creating those policies, and, and I believe in them. And part of them says you need to have a minimum size sidewalk. And it also says in these foundational philosophies that uh, you're not going to use the full width of the sidewalk anymore, and we're not going to use the street anymore, and we're not going to consume parking spaces anymore, et cetera. So if you look at the combination of those and you believe in those, uh, and, and, and in part because uh, we're targeting pedestrian safety and have to have a minimum sidewalk width, uh, we're also targeting a, uh, safe use of the entire sidewalk. Uh, but uh, you go from there and then you design your, you use your design criteria, you make up your rules. Uh, and unfortunately, I have to admit, it is not a fair system. It's just not going to be fair. The only way to be fair would be to cancel this and just not do it so that nobody can have outdoor dining. And I just, I, I think that would be a shame. Uh, and so I think we, we, when we first started this, Carol, I know you, you've said at the beginning, uh, you know, one size won't fit all a year ago when we started this thing. Uh, and we all, we all agree, or I, I agree that, that, it's not necessarily fair, uh, but, but it stems from a logical uh, analysis and thoughtful uh, process on how we developed all this. And so, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, look, look, at, look at the re one of the restaurants on, on Baltimore, second block of Baltimore Avenue. The sidewalk itself is only five feet wide. How can you put a dining table set up on a five foot wide table. It's, and I'm, I'm sorry, but it's in your area too. Uh, it's, just, it's just unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Maybe, maybe during streetscape, we can try to accommodate 
some better, uh, some people better. Maybe those five foot sidewalks will go to seven foot. At least that's the plan from the Wilmington Baltimore Avenue uh, Streetscape Task Force is to have a minimum of seven feet. But even so, unless we have bigger buffers or, or, or wider areas, uh, it's just not going to do. So I'm sorry, it's just not going to fit the bill for everybody. Uh, anyhow, I'd like, to, uh, is there anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, let, let this young lady go first. Oh, no, sir. I need you to come to the microphone. State your name and who you might be affiliated with. My name is Kayla Tinsley. I'm a news reporter with the WBOC. Speak a little closer. My name is Kayla Tinsley. I'm a news reporter with the WBOC, and I'm just asking for clarification. So if there's a restaurant that wants to proceed with outdoor dining, so they have to go through the application in order to do that, correct? Correct. And is that, that has to be done by June 1st? There is no deadline for uh, making application. Uh, it, it's really just the sooner the better. You want it soon, start soon. If, you, if you're, you're not uh, in a hurry and are willing to open by August 1st, then procrastinate, or whatever. But Yeah, the, the significance of the June 1st date is really for those restauranteurs who currently have outdoor dining. If they don't get their new application in and get approved under the new rules, they'll have to remove their current outdoor dining until they get that process taken care of. As we said, the commissioners could revisit that date and extend it, but as of now, that's, that, real, that date really is, is, is most important for those who have outdoor dining currently. Okay, that was it, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yolanda, would you like to say something else? Um, come, come to the microphone. I just, I just wanna go in with the whole picture clear for me to perform what I do. Um, I do have a driveway, which I did use last year and the year before. When, am I allowed to use that? Well, we're gonna have a discussion. Uh, th this topic is specifically outdoor dining on public space, and the way we've defined public space essentially is a public sidewalk, okay? So you're talking about a situation where additional dining would be on private property. So that's a different discussion. We're entertaining that discussion at our April workshop meeting uh, to talk about that, the, the situation like egg or green turtle or something like that. Uh, you know, there are other restaurants, I don't want to get into naming them, but there are other restaurants that have used driveways, for instance. Uh, but one of, the, one of the places had uh, a driveway with residents upstairs, correct? Uh, and legally they can't block the sidewalk with dining tables because they have to have egress and, uh, and access to the property. <coughs> Excuse me, and there's other rules that have to be followed. So that discussion is to come. Okay, I, but it's a now the people that don't meet the criteria is it's over, correct? I'll say that again. It be like us, like if we don't have the enough space to put, uh, we can no longer have uh, outdoor dining. Possibly not, but that's what we have to discuss. Okay, okay. You know, I just uh, want to go uh, with the clear rules not to break them. Well, the other thing, the other thing we haven't mentioned, and uh, I've talked with the city manager about, is, is that we need to be sending a letter to all the restaurants mm -hmm. that they all need to come into compliance with their permits of compliance. So we've got a lot of restaurants that exceed, very much exceed what their maximum seated uh, capacity is. Uh, and so we need to be addressing that and make sure they come into compliance with that. But Mayor, just be clear, maybe I'm missing a, a, a nuance here, that if you're on public property today and you don't have the space based on the new um, formula, does your, do your tables have to not exist tomorrow? No. I, I, or how long I, do they get I, to after, stay or do they till, get till, to stay yeah. at all? I, I think we're basically, it, this, if this passes, yeah. what exists today can remain till June 1st. Till June 1st. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. Anybody uh, else from the public? Uh, if not, I'd like to uh, turn it back to the commissioners for any additional discussion, and then at some point I would entertain a motion, uh, uh, preferably in the affirmative, to uh, uh, adopt the uh, policy for di outdoor dining on public space and the licensing procedure for outdoor dining on public space as before us. 
Uh, uh, Mayor, I, I'm, I'm fully in support of this. It, it's, it's certainly not perfect. Um, I would like to see it more expansive, but I think um, a lot of hard work and, and thought has gone into this, and I think it's, we're headed in the right direction. I, I thank you and, and Commissioner Gossett for making a lot of the changes that I was advocating for. Um, I, I certainly, and so I think this is great and we're in the right direction. Um, I would love to um, talk more uh, in the very near future about what could possibly be done on Wilmington and, and Baltimore um, and, and maybe discuss some exceptions uh, for those streets. Um, you know, we, we were very much two years ago against, uh, you know, street cafes or streeteries or parklets, whatever you want to call them. Um, and that doesn't work on Rehoboth Avenue, but it could very well work on Baltimore and Wilmington. Um, so I would like to continue that discussion at a later time, um, but I, I'm in favor with moving forward with this now. Um, and I thank so do we have you a both. Motion? Did you, did you make a motion? I, I didn't. No, I was just giving comments. I will make a ma motion if you'd like. Sure. Um, I move uh, that we adopt a resolution establishing policy for restaurants to use public space for outdoor dining. Second. We've got a motion by Commissioner Ed Stranowski and a uh, second by uh, Commissioner Tony Sharp uh, to adopt the uh, resolution in front of us establishing a policy or adopting a policy for outdoor dining on public space that's in front of us. Is there any further discussion among the commissioners? Uh, if not, then uh, I'd like to do a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner uh, Jay Legree? Aye. Commissioner Ed Stranowski? Aye. Commissioner Susan Gay? Aye, and I'd just like to say also thank you, uh, Mayor, and to Commissioner Gossett and to the whole and the, the city staff and everybody who worked on this. It's a real challenge, and I think that you did it very efficiently and in good time. Um, and I was pleased to see that one of the uh, headlines in the, in the newspaper mentioned that other towns are now looking to us because, uh, for, to see how it's done. So we're leading the way, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gossett? Aye. Commissioner Bennett? Aye. And the chair votes aye, and uh, the... Uh, Could I vote? Oh, would you like to vote? <laughs> I would. Oh, then I'll, I, I shouldn't have revealed my... That's Go right. Ahead. Aye. Okay. <laughs> now we've got a, a unanimous approval, and the uh, uh, policy is adopted. Uh, and all these thanks to uh, uh, the authors need to include uh, City Manager Sharon Lynn, Evan Miller, uh, Howard Rothstein, and uh, Matt Janis. They devoted a lot of time to doing this also and going out and measuring, and they're going to be the ones... Uh, surveying and uh, working with the uh, owners. So we, we again thank them. Uh, Mayor, could I ask a related question or, or clarification? So the, um, the, the outdoor dining that currently exists, uh, which may not be in compliance with these new rules, um, what's, what's the enforcement on that? Um, I'm assuming that we're not letting people just completely block sidewalks. Um, how are we juggling some of those non-conformities um, going in to the what will probably be a pretty busy spring season. Go ahead. So, so um, from now uh, until June first, obviously we'll have uh, our code enforcement officer Howard Rothstein uh, and other m members of uh, building and licensing uh, when time permits, um, as well as the uh, police department do a cursory look on a daily basis and make sure, number one, that the areas are safe, safe for pedestrians and safe for uh, motorists who might abut those, uh, those areas and will contact uh, those uh, individually, if not um, by phone, by personal visit. So I know Howard has uh, already you know, been in contact with, with folks and We'll follow up with a letter, as the mayor re recommended, and uh, just advise of, of where we are in the commissioner's vote today. And so leaving a lot of discretion up to, to the building and licensing staff. I, and, but I'm assuming we will not be permitting um, tables on, on the streets. I, I don't, where is that question coming from? Because if, if they have outdoor dining right now, yeah. They can't expand it. They can't do anything else. 
because that's what's permitted and authorized, but by June 1st, they have to have removed that. So I, I guess my question is, what we what was currently authorized for some restaurants were, was in the street. We had the barriers and, and everything. So technically, I think what we're saying is that license is still valid until it's revoked on June 1. Uh, so that's where I was just looking for some clarification. Well, I don't... Yeah, it's, it's, I see it. it. Maybe it's complicated, maybe it's not. But uh, we have said in our philosophy that we adopted in our policy that we're not using full width of sidewalk. We're not using pedestrian pathways. We're not using uh, parking spaces. We're not using the street. So it kind of limit. I think that is what becomes self-limiting. I, I think when you say that building licensing has a fair amount of discretion, I think the discretion here is that if it's not currently out now, not being used for outdoor dining now, anything new would have to come under the new set of rules, make application to, to be able to do it. So if there were tables in the streets previously, they've been brought in because the barriers were brought in. Yeah. They can't put a table out in the street. Okay. They just they have to follow the new. Also, the street barriers were something the city did. Right. I mean, that was part of, the, that's what, part of what the city did to it, and we're not doing that. Right. So. It is, it is. But I think some of the confusion, perhaps, is that some folks walked, to, walked away just now saying they can do what they used to do um, until June 1. And, and that's what I wanted clarified. Right. So right. It, when this goes out into the public, Businesses are not confused. Right. 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 Well, that's, that's not the case. Um, and Howard is, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, going to be the one that, that needs to target it. Mayor mentioned um, in a last meeting or two meetings ago about um, some restaurants doing table creep. And, you know, we, we do manage that and we handle that uh, as, as best we can. And, to try to be gentle with these folks. So I, I have faith in Howard that he can do that. Thank, Thank you. Good Thank point. you. Sorry good for point. Nope, good point. going off on that. Anybody else up here? Before we go to the next item, thank you very much. Uh, what we'll do is go to uh, the next item of uh, old business, which is consider adoption of city budget for the fiscal year April 1, 2022 through March 31st, 2023. Sharon? Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Commissioners, for your, your uh, insight into the fiscal year 23 budget. We started this process with two meetings in January, one meeting in February, and now we're here uh, for the conclusion of the discussions on the, uh, on the budget. Um, this is a $30,149,743 balance budget. Uh, it does represent $23,699,743 in the operating budget and a uh, $6,450,000 CIP. Um, the, some of the changes that, uh, very minor change, minimal changes that have been made since the last time we discussed, and you saw this uh, on page 25, there's increased police salaries and though um, uh, FICA and Medicare associated with those increased police salaries, that's based on the, um, the uh, contract settlement with the police union. Um, so I'm happy to report there was uh, a, um, a settlement with the bargaining unit, and that uh, incorporates a 3% increase for 2023, and a, it's a three-year contract, 3% 3 for 2023, 2.5% for 2024, and 2.5% for 2025. Uh, so that increase uh, is, um, is included in the budget, and uh, we reduced the contingency amount. You'll recall the contingency was uh, just a little over $400,000, so that uh, reduced the contingency, and then, um, on page six, we reduced the prior year fund balance that was reserved from 1.6 million to 1.1 million, and that's due to the uh, Sussex County uh, uh, grant for their, based on their realty transfer tax. Uh, grant, the uh, county uh, is awarding the city $500,000 that we'll be able to use for the state road pump station project. Um, it is a matching grant, so the city has $500,000 in for the uh, pump station as well. Um, 
the this uh, budget represents uh, no tax increase for the citizens of Rehoboth Beach, no utility uh, rate increases for citizens, um, and it uh, um, adds a position of assistant city manager, uh, which will take effect April 1. Uh, Mr. Miller will be um, in, in that position then. Uh, we budget conservatively, as we do every year, and I believe this is um, equitable and uh, a, uh, a fair budget. I thank Mr. Dukes, who's away right now watching a Phillies game in Florida, uh, of course, Mr. Miller, and um, other staff who uh, budgeted conservatively for their departments. Uh, I will mention that the CIP um, is obviously... Uh, more than uh, in prior years, but we do have many projects that are consistent with keeping the infrastructure of the city um, up to up to snuff. Uh, it includes Baltimore Avenue restroom uh, expansion along with Delaware Avenue restroom that we haven't yet completed um, and uh, other various uh, CIP items and of course, a $2 million expense for the state road pump station. We have our 450,000 annual uh, amount in the 2023 budget for citywide paving. Um, that's served uh, the city well for many years. And uh, we have some uh, replacement vehicles in here. And of course, the Luke Cosmo uh, parking pay stations, which um, we're replacing the, the park Parkeons on, uh, on Rehoboth Avenue. So it does represent a balanced budget at $30,149,743. Um, I will also say that today we received notice from the state that the increase, they're increasing health insurance rates, um, um, and we didn't know this until today, so uh, the health insurance rates will be increasing by approximately 9%, um, and we'll be able to uh, submit that in the budget and edit the budget uh, for the final, but we're not changing the, the, uh, the bottom line number of $30,149,743. We'll be able to take that money out of the contingency. Um, and, and just for... Uh, a reminder, the, uh, the uh, City Personnel Code, Chapter 46-25, regarding health insurance, um, spells out that any increase, annual increase for health insurance, over 4% is split with the city and uh, city personnel. So in this case, approximately 9% over 4 is 5%. The uh, city employees will be paying 2.5%. And um, the uh, and sharing that with the um, the city. Very good. Any questions, Any questions? of the, the city manager? Uh, Sharon, if I if I may, um, we had a, an, an increase in in capital improvements this year. Next year, um, for fiscal year uh, twenty four, that's going up by another ten million. When do we start planning for that? I mean, I, I certainly don't want to sit down on January 2nd and start thinking about how we increase, how do we raise $10 million more um, in that year. I, I, I assume that we would start that process this year some, sometime. Yeah, so your question, Commissioner, brings up... Uh, a, a previous commissioner's question uh, probably six years ago when we went from a $1 million CIP to a, approximately a $2.5 million CIP based on the needs, uh, infrastructure needs mostly, and equipment needs. And um, I, I do recall that after the summer season, um, the commissioners focused on different ways to um, come up with funding uh, future budgets. Um, there was a tax increase that year, and uh, other, other services uh, were increased as well. So it'll be up to the, the uh, mayor and commissioners to decide when that 
when that occurs, um, I would recommend you know it start sooner than later. Um, I, I know some of the commissioners seated here today recall those conversations, and, and they're difficult. Just keep in mind that the next is a five-year CIP, so what's projected in future years also depends on the commitment uh, of the, um, the mayor and commissioners to get these projects done. Um, it's, a, it's an outlook, and it's a view for you to be able to see what's in the future that is recommended by staff. Certainly it's a lot of money, and certainly uh, you have to give some hard thought on how, how those funds will be raised. And, and, and I, I had raised that during the budget process that I thought we ought to look at, I realize we can't look all five years ahead, but I thought that during the budget process we should take a hard look at the, the, the two and three years out because I had the, you know, the same concern that it, there's a sudden, a sudden increase. And I recall you saying that. And so you're, yes. you're basically saying that the time to start that is in, is in the fall to, to figure out what new revenue sources. No, I think the time to start that is as soon as possible. I, I'm just mentioning how, how it was in done then, right. prior yeah. past years, how it was done. I, I do have a question. I may be getting ahead of myself or not, or not remembering it correctly, but the next thing on our budget is, I mean, on our agenda today is approving this contract. My recollection is it's significantly more than what was budgeted. Is that the current fiscal year, the uh, the bid that we're talking about? Then where is it? I don't see it in the CIP, so I just didn't know. what I, I couldn't remember. Oh, this is for this the... This is 3B, phase 3B yeah. of the uh, wastewater upgrades. Too big. That's been on the books for a long time, and... It's in a previous CIP. Yeah, right. and I'll explain what it is if, if you want me That's to. That's fine. I'm, I just okay. want to make sure that it didn't have any ramifications for what we're doing with the budget today. Mr. Miller uh, will explain that um, when, it, when it comes up on the agenda. Okay, great. Uh, so if you don't mind, uh, let me go to the members of the public oh, first, sure, sure. and if you don't mind, we'll do it a little backwards. Uh, any members of the public like to comment on the uh, budget and our capital improvement plan? Uh, seeing none, uh, I'll turn it over to the commissioners. Uh, See Mayor, I, I move uh, we approve the fiscal year 23 budget, balance budget with a total amount of $30 million, $149,743. Second. We've got a uh, motion by Commissioner Shinaski and a uh, second by Commissioner Sharp uh, to adopt the uh, city's budget for the fiscal year April 1st, 2022 through March 31st, 2023 in the amount of $30 million, $149,743. Uh, is there any further discussion among the commissioners? Uh, do a roll, uh, do a Mayor, group. Yes. I'd like to remind everybody that uh, the money in there for the for trash collection for the coming year has been approved. It's a balanced budget, and uh, we have that counted for both coming and going. So if we are going to talk about setting the fees, but no matter what we do, it's covered. She's got it. So go forward with that. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll just do a, a group vote. All those in favor of adopting the budget uh, as noted, plus signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? And the uh, budget is passed unanimously. Thank you very much, Sharon. You and Thank your crew you. did an uh, excellent job on this. Uh, it seems to be getting easier and better process each year. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to go to the next item of uh, business, which is new business item A, consider award of wastewater treatment plant, capital improvement plan, upgrade phase 3B, Contract to M.F. Ronca and Sons, Inc. Uh, I'll just uh, note that uh, Mr. Williams is um, out of town today, so Mr. Miller will um, fill you in on, on this. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners, and members of the public. Uh, again, I'll be filling in for our Director of Public Works, who's attending the uh, Blue Hen Villanova game. And last I checked, they're down in the half, so we're going to have to wish them good luck. Um, so before you today is the bid evaluation or recommendation for the wastewater treatment plant, capital improvement plan upgrade of 3B. You'll recall this is the dewatering phase of the upgrades at the treatment plant. <clears throat> so... Uh, 
So you will recall that the uh, city manager reported at the workshop meeting back on March 7th that the bids were open for phase 3B. Um, and uh, as you can see in the chart here, we received a total of four bids. Um, uh, detailed bid analysis was done by GHD and it's provided in the agenda materials. The low bidder is MF Ronca at a little over $7.6 million. And Ronca is the contractor that's currently working on phase two um, that we have down at the uh, wastewater treatment plant. And we've been very pleased with their work so far. Uh, the low bid is approximately $1.1 million above the engineer's estimate and about 700,000 above the remaining funds in our current SRF loan. Uh, the inflation is certainly a large attributor to the increase in the cost that we see um, from the engineer's estimate to the actual bids that were received. Um, since the construction period for the project will stretch into fiscal year 24, we're planning to augment the remaining SRF funds with uh, budget funds in the FY24 budget. For, so for the upcoming fiscal year, fiscal year 23, there are sufficient funds that are remaining in the SRF loan. So at the bottom of the uh, slide there, you see roughly uh, remaining funds in the SRF loan. We have 6.9 million, uh, which makes up a difference of 741,000 uh, from the re remaining SRF loan and the low bid. Uh, so as we continue to proceed uh, with uh, planning for the fiscal year 24 budget, uh, we'll identify the best ways to pay for those, the increase in costs. Uh, but I have talked with uh, Finance Director Bert Dukes. I had a conversation with him yesterday, and he's pretty confident that we have reserved cash available for this project. Um, so the request for the board of action today is to approve the award for the wastewater treatment plant CIP upgrade phase three, B to MF Ronca in the amount of $7,641,000. Um, the, we are planning to award or hoping to award the contract to them during the first week of April. It's, it's estimated that they are going to need about six months to get the materials and they want to start in September. Uh, and it will be a two year project completed, uh, spring of 2024 or FY25. And I can answer any questions you have. Any questions uh, among the commissioners? I just have a curiosity. The, the engineering estimate Mm -hmm. In the world of engineering, which I'm not familiar with, is that is that way off, or is that just pretty much the cost of doing business when you come within that dollar amount to what we thought versus what we're going to have to fund? Right. I'm not, I'm not sure how, uh, you know, I think, uh, as I mentioned, inflation certainly was a large attributor to that, uh, and I don't know whether such significant differences like that are ordinary. Mm -hmm. Certainly this is a very large scale capital project. It is very specialized as well. And then just with the market supply, um, it, it's very challenging to estimate these things these days, especially with labor and materials, so. That makes um, sense, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One other question if I may. I, I, I may just overlook it in here, <clears throat> but is there any schedule specifically tied? I mean, you spoke about April 1, mm -hmm. uh, pulling materials and perhaps the start date of September 1, et cetera. But is there any uh, specifically laid out document within the uh, contract that lays that ties them to a schedule? Sure. I would have to go back and see the bid documents if there was a, a timeline specified within the bid documents. But I would think once the bid is awarded, then they'd proceed with developing a construction timeline. And was there any uh, aspect in this of creating an incentive or a penalty for not following um, the specific calendar or, or projected uh, dates? Completion. Sure. I don't know that I can answer that confidently. Um, I would have to check with Kevin and okay. Thank check you. on that. Yeah. Uh, with that, we'll go to the members of the public. Uh, Walter? Make sure we can hear you in that microphone, if you would. Thank you, Walter Brittingham, 123 on Open Avenue. I apologize for the question, but I couldn't print the whole agenda. Um, and apparently the people have been doing good work, but where is Ronka out of? It, it's just a management company of some sort. Or are they from around here? They've obviously been working. Sure, I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I can look it up real quick. What was that? He's gonna look it up. I'll look it up real no, quick. No, it's, not, it's okay. not, it's not that critical. Um, but is this not part of what we're working towards with the dewatering that the product will go to the county? That's a question. Yes, 
That's correct. So this would be part of the dewatering phase or actually would be the dewatering phase. So then we would no longer do land application and we would take the dewatered product to Sussex County. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter, we have uh, researched where Ronka's out of Glenn. So they are out of Bethlehem, PA. Thank you, Walt. Anybody else? Uh, if not, uh, we'll entertain a motion uh, to, uh, there it is up there, approve award of the WWT BCIP upgrade phase three to MF Ronca and the amount noted. So moved. Second. We've got a motion by Commissioner Susan Gay and a second by Commissioner Ed Chernowski to approve the award of the uh, wastewater treatment plant. Capital Improvement Program upgrade phase three to MF Ronca in the amount of seven million six hundred forty-one thousand uh, dollars. Is there any further discussion? If not, we'll do a group vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, and the motion is uh, carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll go to the next item of. Uh, New business status of House Bill 146 impacting municipal elections by proposing to integrate local and state voter registration. Um, would like to make note that uh, there are support documents embedded in the agenda. I think they're pretty much self explanatory, uh, but uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but see if you have any questions on it. There is an, uh, a, a, an accompanying Senate Bill number 233 uh, that uh, is also being passed around. Uh, of note, uh, HB 146 uh, gives a timeline of uh, what, 20? January 24. 20, 20, actually in the copy I have it says 2022. Oh, right. In, in Senate, Senate Bill 233, it pushes it off to 2024. I participated in a Zoom call with one of the sponsors, Rep Representative uh, Shoup. I uh, was literally given uh, eight, eight hours notice from the Delaware League to participate. I participated, Bethany Beach, Henlope and Acres, some of the other uh, groups did. Uh, and that's where uh, I generated the letter that's included in there so that they uh, understood that there were some challenges. Uh, and the information I got came from, directly from uh, Donna more our elections uh, person, as well as uh, Glenn. So again, I just wanted to, to have you have an awareness of this so that I could try to follow up with it. Uh, honestly, I think it is uh, going to go through. Uh, and what it does is it, it uh, gives us a few challenges. I did pose to, in the Zoom uh, meeting, I did pose the uh, uh, premise that state uh, what is the state uh, qualifications, identification, are not the same level that what we do. Uh, and I pose that to the election, uh, head of the elections, as well as Representative Shoup. Uh, and my recollection is the answer was, you're right. <laughs> yeah. So that's still a concern, but I'd, I wanted you to have an awareness so that Glenn and I could continue to work with Donna and continue to... Uh, uh, try to challenge this a little bit. Yeah, I guess what I'd add, Mayor, is that you know th this is one of those items that you, you, we always talk about. There's so much work to be done. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And Donna Moore does such a good job with our elections here. And uh, you know it's very rare that somebody complains that they weren't properly registered or something. So it's one of those issues where it's not a one size fits all. We have non-resident voters. This bill. Um, it recognizes that we have non-resident voters, but it doesn't do anything to accommodate it. It says, sorry, you have non-resident voters, keep a second registration list. And that's horrible in election procedures, having two sets of registered voter lists. So I, I just think for a lot of reasons, um, and chiefly probably is that Donna does such a good job, we just don't, we don't need a change. And she's talked, Donna's talked about how if this were to pass, you know, basically, she'd get a list from the, the state voter, well, from the Sussex County um, Department of Elections that would show everybody in our zip code, and she'd have to call through all of those names to see which of those names actually are Rehoboth Beach municipality voters to figure out who are um, who's on that list. And then as the election's going on, I mean, she's required to produce that list over and over. And as people move in and out of the jurisdiction and register and don't register, she's, she's going to have to be continually looking at that list trying to get it out to the candidates in a timely way. It's just, it's just a bill that it wasn't designed for Hobart Beach and 
I think that's why the mayor's taken a stance against it. Uh, well, and, and, and to be fair to them, they did indicate that, uh, or Don indicated that the, the list she got, she requested last year, because this has been around for a while. In fact, we, it's been in front of us before. Yeah, that was just uh, And uh, Donna indicated that her, the list was over 13,000 yeah. people, whereas in Rehoboth, we only have, what, 1,600 or so voters. So that means she had to uh, cull all those almost 12,000 plus uh, people. Uh, they did uh, concede that uh, that's a lot and, and that, that perhaps they could uh, do a much smaller area. They couldn't make it coincide with the city limits for some reason, but they said that they would try to make it smaller. So maybe uh, maybe there's only going to be 3,000 or so on, on the list, but you still we have to call that. So that's an important thing. The other thing Donna was uh, concerned about is that when election time comes and uh, uh, the, the new candidates ask for the voter list, uh, that it's going to be more challenging to get out timely uh, and update on a timely basis. So again, these are some things pushed forward. Uh, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, there are other municipalities that have already signed on to this, town of Georgetown, town, other towns that, and so there's, there's some for it, some against it. Oh, I, mean, I remember our conversations last year about it, and it, it was it was frustrating because um, we talked about you know first of all was there some technological solution to culling the list you know some sort of software that could be used to we feed in all the streets we don't have that many and and you could get a list that way but the question the other question I raised then was what if you have uh, a, a prior resident property owner who is registered here already and is for some reason not registered with the state. So in addition to a non-resident resident list, you might have to have a third list. In other words, you don't want to leave somebody out just because they're not on the state list, right? So that was a question, and, and there were no answers to these. And I didn't realize this had come back, but you, you think it's going to go through, even though the, the opposition is pretty strong. No, no. I, I, it's hard to say the opposition is well, strong. The, Again, the there's, saw, there's but, some yeah. that have signed up for it in Bridgeville, right. and uh, even Milford, uh, you know, his old old right. city is, is... Well, it's currently a voluntary program, right? I mean, they can do... You, we, anybody can, yeah, can use correct. it, and, and that's... Which it seems like the, the way it ought to remain, but, my, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned the, the concern because of non-resident voting. I think it goes way beyond that, and this is why I don't understand what they're thinking. I don't know that any municipality matches up with their zip code. Do you think? No, I don't know. Whether they have non-resident voting or not, right. so that means everybody, including Lewis, that doesn't have non-resident voting, is going to suddenly have a list that doesn't. I don't. I don't understand what they're thinking. It's probably the actual, they're not. Yeah, I mean, it, so yes, it's a problem. But that, so then the solution really. I mean, the the challenge goes to us to solve it. We we have to. If it goes through, then we just have, we have to solve it. Right. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Okay. They're not going to provide the, the the list of actual residents. We have to right. do that. Okay. Is there any, do you know, is there, if we could address, is there any uh, appetite for amendment to call out um, municipalities that have non-resident voting from the bill to approach it that way? Uh, I, I, it's, it's not spelled out. It's, it's something that we could, probably easiest to go to the Delaware League and. Uh, yeah, I, th I think it's a problem for others, not just the non-resident towns. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I think yeah. I'm, you know, so again, the, the awareness is that uh, I would like to be able to work with Glenn and Donna and city manager and continue to pursue this uh, with uh, a disfavorable position. Uh, Mayor, and, just, just a ahead. quick question due to time here. Um, if it does, if it were to pass and we get a list that is gonna be considerably larger than we could ever use, what would we, we would just have to set up those procedures? Yeah, we. Uh, I guess first thing you'd try to work with IT to see if they can electronically remove yeah. them, <laughs> them, but uh, you know, I don't know what the parameters are because if you want to do it by zip code, well our zip code is the same as the zip code on the outside of the city, so <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's challenging. Has anyone talked about what was it that germinated this idea? That well, this would be good for well, it's a state state legislator that that's been getting uh, uh, gripes from constituents that they go and they register to vote at, in, for the state elections at the Department of Motor Vehicles, and then they come to uh, a municipal 
election and find out that they needed to have registered separately with that municipality. He's trying to make it an easier process where you register once and vote in state election as well as municipal. So okay. there's, there's good intention, but the consequences are, are potentially devastating for some of the municipalities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any members of the public want to say anything on HB 146? If not, we'll go to the next item. Uh, the next item is uh, commissioner announcements and comments. Uh, I'd just like to say very loud that it's been two years since COVID came, and I want us all, the mayor and the commissioners, to give a big shout out and thank you to our employees. Uh, and one of the ways I'm doing that is by uh, shouting out as loud as I can by putting it on the marquee out there uh, that'll run till mid next week, I guess, as a thank you. So that's on all our behalf. Uh, you know, we we don't, haven't said it that much, uh, that we appreciate our employees and we recognize their challenges and commitments for the last two years. Uh, and so this was that opportunity for us to do that. Mayor, I saw that sign on the way in today and I thought that was a stellar idea. Thank you, thank you. Uh, with that, I want to review future meeting dates. Uh, let's see here. Tuesday, March 22nd, 9 a.m. is a tree meeting, tree number four. Monday, April 4th, 9 a.m. is our standard workshop meeting. Uh, April 8th is a planning commission CDP meeting. I just wanted to throw that in there. Obviously, it's not a commissioner meeting, but April 8th, CDP meeting hosted by the planning commission. Uh, Tuesday, April 12th, 9 a.m. is tree meeting number five. Tuesday, April 19th is the Board of Commissioners meeting. Uh, it's the regular meeting rescheduled from Good Friday, April 15th. And then the next meeting is April 26th, tree meeting number six, right? Uh, so with that... Is there any other commissioner comments? I just have one. Yes. I'm just wondering if we're going to ever be able to get to a point where our meetings could possibly be constrained to the week that we have a workshop and the week that we have a regular meeting. I think we're getting very close. That, very that's close. what I was we hoping. We, we've just ended outdoor dining. We've got the trees on there that I want to keep the momentum going. Uh, and et cetera. So yeah, we're getting very close. Thank very you. Close. Until the next new topic comes up. Um, no. <laughs> Mayor, I just have, a, I just have a, a clarification. I think when you, you mentioned the April 8th Planning Commission meeting, but that is actually their public hearing for the CDP. It was my understanding. That that, okay. That's what that meeting is, okay. a formal public hearing. Very good. Uh, Mayor, if I could, um, I, I just want to let you know, um, I may have a conflict this, this coming Tuesday, so I may not be in attendance for that tree meeting. Um, and also, we skipped over the um, report from the senior center um, earlier. Oh, we um, sure did. <laughs> so I, which is fine. I, I really don't have anything new to update. Um, I just want to encourage everyone. The, the senior center does have a lot of events and, and programs and stuff, um, and everything is nicely listed on the on their website. So I just encourage people to take a look at that. It is capehenlopenseniorcenter.org. I keep getting their automated phone calls, and they still don't tell me when the next pancake breakfast yeah, is. They still have not scheduled one. Thank you all. Uh, next item is uh, citizen comment. Uh, Walter, do you have anything further you'd like to say? I'd like to know why item number 20 is not before you go into executive session. Just, all we have to wait just you, you wait and see. You'll be happy. You'll be pleased. Um, Commissioner announcements, review future meetings, citizen comment. Uh, next opportunity is if desired to go into executive session. Does anybody desire to do that for the purposes uh, noted? No. Nope. Hearing none, we'll go to the next item of business, uh, possible consideration of designating an interim city manager. Just want to share with you, of course, that uh, city manager Sharon Lynn will be leaving us. 
uh, and the expectation is that uh, a replacement uh, city manager will not be on board before she leaves. So the uh, charter uh, outlines how we deal with that, and the charter specifically says, uh, in case of the absence, I'm just going to paraphrase it here, uh, in case of the absence of the uh, manager, the commissioners may designate some qualified person to perform the duties of such office during uh, city manager's absence. Uh, the compensation which the city manager shall receive for the performance of duty shall be fixed by the commissioners. So we have the opportunity uh, to designate some qualified person to be an interim uh, manager. Okay, that's it. So uh, I open it for discussion among the commissioners. Uh, <clears throat> Mayor, I, I, uh, I would like to bring forward a motion actually to designate Evan Miller as interim city manager effective upon the resignation of the date, resignation date of the city manager and until such time that a new city manager has been selected and their work begins for the city. Second. Uh, we've got a motion by uh, Commissioner Gossett and a second by uh, Commissioner Stranowski uh, to uh, nominate uh, Evan Miller as interim city manager. Uh, is there any discussion? For me, for me, it's uh, somewhat of a no-brainer. Uh, Evan's worked uh, and mentored under Sharon for, I think, at least five years. Uh, he uh, essentially has, uh, even though he hadn't had the title, he effectively has acted like an assistant city manager. Uh, as of April 1st, uh, now that we've approved the budget, he will become the assistant city manager. Uh, so I think it's a natural that we uh, promote uh, Evan, if you will, uh, into the interim city manager's position. Uh, is there any further discussion? If not, then I'll uh, just do a group uh, group call, a vote. All those in favor of uh, uh, designating uh, Evan Miller as the uh, interim city manager signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Uh, and uh, congratulations, Evan, the, you're unanimously uh, uh, approved for that position. Thank you. I'll be working with you. Look forward to it. Uh, the next item on our agenda is a possible consideration of hiring an outside agency to assist in the search for a new city manager. Uh, there's probably not, not a lot of people that uh, were, were around eight years ago and remember the process, at least three commissioners up here, Commissioner Gossett, myself, uh, and Tony Sharp, I think, uh, were part of the process to replace then city manager Greg Freese. Uh, and uh, we hired an, an outside company, and maybe maybe you'd like to explain what was our process back then, uh, and uh, I think that's uh, the, the process we're headed to. The process that we uh, had back when we uh, did an executive search for the current city manager is to engage with an outside search firm. Um, we solicited proposals from several firms at that time, selected the firm, uh, and then they um, conducted um, outreach not only to, uh, because it had been such a long time since we had um, uh, had a city manager, a new city manager, I think the previous one served over 20 years, um, there really was not any uh, process in place. So with the aid of the executive search firm, they helped us develop a uh, revised uh, job description for the city manager, and then also um, a position statement of what the city of Rehoboth Beach really uh, offers as an employment opportunity for an individual, um, being uh, the size of the city, the size of the budget, the number of staff uh, individuals that the city has, um, and basically putting out that, that job position and job description, and then going out <clears throat> bringing actually that was comprised, comprised by interviews of all the city uh, commissioners at that time, and then also a meetings with all of the uh, individual department heads at that time to get their input as to what uh, they would like to see in the city manager. Um, that information was taken again by the executive search firm and put into this process, and, and the search then began after we, the mayor and commissioners, approved that job description and the search uh, criteria. Uh, then they went out for, uh, with that material, solicit individuals, um, and uh, the process took anywhere from four to um, 12 weeks at that period of time. Um, 
and um, they came back with successful a list of about 15 uh, potential candidates for us. The uh, search executive at that time reviewed those uh, resumes and applications with us as a um, mayor and commissioners. Um, <clears throat> then uh, she also, the individual, then uh, based on our discussions, reduced that to five potential candidates, and those candidates were brought into the city for personal interviews at that time. And after uh, extensive interviews with those individuals, all done one-on-one, -on -one, um, selection process was made. Um, so that that is a successful process that worked in the past, um, and I hope that we are able to uh, continue that for the, this coming process for the selection of a city manager. Questions, thoughts? Just a uh, comment, just a comment from me that if we follow that same process and we have the same amount of luck that we had with our current city manager who's gonna leave us with a city that's much better than when she found it, I think we'll all be in good stead. Yeah, Patrick, thank you. Uh, you provided us uh, three uh, responses from executive search companies. Uh, I found them somewhat comparable uh, in terms of thing, you know, that uh, uh, they're not just going to be actively searching. They're going to do passive search, which means targeting people and things like that. Uh, and uh, the price range is uh, uh, n nothing to, to make me choose one over the other necessarily. Uh, but I, I personally like the familiarity of the last company that we worked with. And I realize there's only three of us that, that are familiar with them. Uh, but I put a lot of weight and value on uh, the performance uh, and the relationships that we developed with uh, the, the Catherine Tuck Parish uh, at that time. So uh, maybe you know the way I'm leaning on this. But uh, is there any other comments before we uh, entertain uh, a motion? If I may also, as, as the chair of the personnel committee at that time, uh, my interaction with um, the, the search executive was very favorable, always responsive, um, asked some very hard questions. Um, and I felt also, which is an important part to me, and, and I have confirmed this with, with our current city manager, that they, those individuals also felt um, as if they were treated with respect and, and constant communication of updating what's going on, what the city's thinking, and uh, the, the process moving forward. So it, it, it opened my eyes that this is really a two-way street of conversation that needs to be um, continued. And uh, just based on previous um, relationships that, of eight years ago, and I will have to say she's a, a very good um, salesperson, that I get a Christmas card and a call um, just to keep things going, you know? Um, as, a, as a former salesperson, um, those are traits that, that you look for in people, and, and uh, she's very uh, professional in that manner, and um, also has relatives that live in the area, so that's a helpful thing. Thank you, Patrick. Again, uh, you reached out to four companies. Three were responsive. One apparently didn't uh, uh, respond at all. Respond. The pricing, uh, pricing goes anywhere from 24000 28000 295 uh, it's important to know that uh, these are semi-rigid pricing because there are addendums that go on there. You know, you actually uh, pay to fly out the applicants to come interview you, and, and there's different reimbursables, I think, that, that can make it go up a little bit. Uh, but just, again, the, the price range is anywhere from 24000 to under $30,000. Yeah, those those are fixed co the fixed cost of a base price, but the the fluctuating prices, if I may, are advertising, background checks, and the finalist interview travel. So depending on where they're coming from and overnight stays and what have you, but those were would just be billed at uh, ex expenses. The actual cost, there'd be no markup in or anything of that nature. Who who would the search firm work with? Is, is there one point of contact? Would it be the mayor or the personnel committee? when we select the agency? In our past, it has been a, a committee of the whole. Um, as I was a point person, but all of the communications came through me, but the committee of the whole was the mayor and commissioners that met and made decisions and reviewed and okay. what have you. So it, it is not a, a, again, just acting as, as a collector of data and distributing that is what how we use, worked in the past. And I hope that worked well. I'm not sure, but um, I think it did. I thought it worked perfectly. I, I'm inclined to, to go with the company we're already familiar with. 
um, the positive feedback that we got from Sharon from her perspective as an applicant at that time, um, I, I put a lot of consideration into to that being being a good thing. Uh, uh, Commissioner Legree? I went through all three of the uh, prospectuses and all the companies are all three different. Uh, two of them have a considerably larger amounts of, of references than the, than the third. The third one is a, seems like a smaller, more personal company that specializes, did specialize in the central area of Texas, but now they've, they're uh, picking up a lot of uh, work in Pennsylvania and uh, all of them are, are go all the way everywhere. The middle one, the, which happens to be the one that, that we used last time, Ref Tellus, seems to specialize in Maryland and Virginia and this area around here, although they go nationwide. And the last one is another a large company that, that goes nationwide. But the one thing about Ref Tellus is that they, they would probably have a lot more contacts in our area, in Virginia and Maryland, because they, because they have a lot of, they've done a lot of work here. And, uh, and they seem to be a, a well-organized prospectus as opposed to the third one. But uh, the big thing about Raftellus is that Catherine Tuck is a Jayhawk. She graduated from the University of Kansas. She got her master's in Canada. She can't, we can't go wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, as, as a Texan, I would have expected you to uh, uh, focus on some of those. Uh, you're right. Uh, some of these, uh, some of these have references to uh, uh, jobs they've filled in Gaithersburg, Montgomery County, Maryland, Rockville, Ocean City, Maryland, stuff like that. So, um, the list of Virginia is like two thirds of a page long. It's just amazing. I, I think it's great. I think there are a lot of benefits to going with the company that we're the, the most familiar with, and especially if the same if the, if it's the same uh, person is going to be going to be working with us. And mm -hmm. I totally agree with what Commissioner Sharp said about the outcome before and bodes well for the outcome again. In that case, I'd entertain a motion. I was going to say, Mayor, based on, on the discussion here, I, I would like to make a motion to authorize the mayor to enter into a contract with Reptilis Executive Search Services to provide executive search service for the position of city manager. Second. Second. Uh, we have a motion by Commissioner Patrick Gossett and a second by Commissioner Tony Sharp uh, to authorize the mayor to uh, enter and engage with uh, Ref Tellis Consultants uh, for the uh, purpose of seeking uh, a search for a city manager. Is there any additional discussion? Any members of the public have anything to say? Uh, if not, then uh, we'll do a, a group vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, no. And the uh, motion carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, Patrick, you and I will be talking on, on how to get this going. Definitely. Uh, and with that, unless anybody else have, has anything up, else up here, uh, then we'll adjourn this meeting at 4.47 p.m. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you.